the uh, welcome to the Ag Committee meeting. It's, yeah, you can shut that, please. Um, so it's Wednesday, January 11th. We had a short meeting yesterday and uh, wanted to uh, invite the Ag folks in uh, early on and see how things are going at the uh, agency and, uh, and you know what we need to, if there's something we need to help with or, or deal with uh, we may as well get started on it and uh, so I think we'll run around the room uh, Brian uh, you want to start? Sure Senator Colin Moore from the Rutland District and Brian's a vice chair Senator Irene Renner from Chittenden North. Senator Brian Campion, Bennington County. I'm Rich Westman, Senator from Lamoille. And Bobby Starr from Orleans County. And uh, maybe we could uh, do the same in the, in the room. Uh, you want to start? Sure, Senator. Uh, good morning, Ryan Hash, BC of Ag. Uh, obviously, I'm the Agriculture, Climate, and Land Use Policy Manager. Good morning, Senators. Uh, my name is Stephen Glennell. I'm the Director of the Public Health and Agricultural Resource Management Division. Yep. Good morning, Senators. Uh, Dave Huber, Deputy Director of the Public Health and Agricultural Resource Management Division. Yep. Stephanie Smith, also uh, same title as Dave Huber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice to see you all today. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Glenn Evans. I'm the Director of the Vermont Ag and Environmental Laboratory. Hi, good morning. My name is Dean Gage. I'm the Assistant Director for the Division of Water Quality. And hello, I'm Laura Petro. I'm the Director of Water Quality at the agency of Yeah, and uh, we have uh, Diane. Oh, it's Diane. Diane Boffeld, Director of Administrative Services uh, uh, with the Agency of Agriculture and the Administration Division. Yeah, and E.B. Good morning um, to all of our senators. Uh, I'm Evie Flory. I'm the Food Safety and Consumer Protection Division Director and also serve as our, our dairy section chief um, within that division. Yeah. Well, uh, thank, uh, thank all of you for coming this morning. Um, and uh, we'll uh, lead off this morning. Uh, the Secretary. Um, is away i believe this morning i had a farm meeting in franklin county um, and so we're gonna have we're gonna have him in at the end of the session to let him know how we did <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh no uh senator now yeah senator welch uh, was having a farm meeting up there and in uh, that was good that, uh, that for Anson to be able to be there, he'll uh, report back to us. Uh, I think we've got him scheduled in tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. So, um, anyways, we may as well get started. Uh, we'll, uh, Diane, would you like to lead off? Well, Senator Sarr, thank you uh, very much for inviting us. Um, you asked for some specific information on the dairy industry that uh, myself and E.B. Flory will present. So would you like us to leave that to the end and let the other folks uh, give their overview of the agency and we can utilize the last bit of time to go through that specific dairy information you requested for today? Yeah, you want to do that at the end? give more time for specific questions potentially yeah okay um, so well, i would uh, i would encourage the folks in the room to to go first and and uh, uh eb flory and i would would round it out at the end if possible awesome yeah that sounds like a plan yeah Thank you. uh so any one of you folks want to lead off the uh, ryan do you want to tell us a little bit about what what you're doing and how it's going, and we'll work our way around the room. Yes, sir. I'd be more than happy to. I have provided uh, a brief set of slides um, with uh, 
uh, Ms. Lehman to share with the committee and I will work to sign on to Zoom so I can um, share the screen up there so you can uh, see it from the email uh, we received um, yeah an update on um, ecosystem services would be related to uh, the payment for ecosystem services working group that was commissioned in uh, 2019 um, and has been meeting diligently ever since. Um, there was a pause for uh, COVID, uh, but the group got back together in 2021 and has subsequently met 28 times in the previous two years. So very active uh, group of members. And I will, uh, stall a bit more to share my screen. <laughs> Let's and see if this works. While, while you're getting ready there, Will, uh, Abby um, Willard, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us what you do? I'd be happy to, Senator Starr. Good morning, everyone. My name is Abby Willard. I'm the director of the Ag Development Division here at the Agency of Agriculture. Sorry, I can't be there with you in person today. I need to take my mom to a doctor's appointment. Um, yeah. So I can share a little bit about the Ag Development Division and then can share some of our accomplishments and vision for the future, uh, if that would be helpful. Yeah, and um, we, you, do you have any particular time crunch or, or uh, time schedule that you need to uh, watch for. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I can be on for the next hour and then I have to hop off at 10 and then I can come back at 10 30, 10 45. So I'm happy yeah. to go early or go late, whatever, whatever suits the committee. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll, we'll, uh, um, we'll get through Ryan and then hop back to you and, and, uh, okay. then, yeah. I'll try to keep it brief then, under an hour for uh, a brief update. Uh, great, is everyone uh, hopefully seeing a brief presentation up there? Um, so, Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group, part of a, a long uh, series of important discussions uh, in the state. I just wanted to put a brief uh, history here as I see it of, of some of the uh, statutory kind of precursors and, and what really uh, created the PES Working Group. Right, but you know, to go back to Act 64 2015, right, that was the first time a definition of healthy soil was put into statute for agriculture. It's been an important part of you know, uh, water quality uh, cleanup efforts, uh, and it, it was subsequent to that. Um, part of the, the continued discussion on how uh, agriculture uh, can maintain uh, viability as a sector uh, and also work to improve not just water quality but other uh, ecosystem services. And so there were a series of bills over the next uh, three years trying to define you know, what is regenerative agriculture, what is regenerative soils, what is regenerative farming. And then Act 64 of 2019 and Act 83 of 2019 gave us two companion bills one defining regenerative farming uh, in part, and the other authorizing and setting up the uh, soil conservation practice and payment for ecosystem services working group, which has subsequently received a, a rename and an additional charge uh, from uh, this committee in particular, and then an extension in time for the working group to meet after providing uh, a summary of uh, the work that the group has done. Uh, payment for ecosystem services or ecosystem services valuation was raised in, by the, uh, the Farmers Watershed Alliance groups that exist in the state, Champlain Valley Farmers Coalition, the Franklin Grand Isle Farmers Watershed Alliance, and the Connecticut River Watershed Farmers Alliance. Uh, you'll recall the joint hearing uh, in the big room with the farmer watershed groups to articulate the progress they've made since Act 64 2015. This was in 2019, so it's been about three years of implementation uh, and how farmers can be uh, hired uh, to provide uh, additional benefit as one framework to look at 
uh, you know, how farmers manage their fields can have uh, deleterious or positive impacts on the environment and other ecosystem service outcomes. And so this, uh, you know, farmers stood up and said, we're, we're ready, we're ready to do more, uh, help set up a program to do this. And from that came uh, Act 83 of 2019, uh, which created the Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group. Uh, the legislative purpose from uh, for the group as charged in the bill uh, was to establish a working group to recommend financial incentives designed to encourage farmers in Vermont to implement agricultural practices that improve soil health, there's that definition again, enhance crop resilience, increase carbon storage and stormwater storage capacity, and reduce agricultural runoff to waters. And, you know, agriculture, in my view, is a, a very exciting sector because it is uh, a land use that can uh, both provide food as well as provide uh, those ecosystem service benefits at the same time. And you don't have to sacrifice one for the other, provided you're applying the right uh, types of management for the soils and the crops being grown. Uh, but that can take a significant amount of, uh, you know, technical experience and, and specialized equipment depending on. Uh, the conservation practice or um, uh, crop being grown. And so this started that, that working group process. Um, Act 83, as I mentioned, was the original genesis. Uh, the group met five times during that time period, held some webinars. Their discussion was very rich and there was consensus about this is, there's something here, but we need more time to research, study, and recommend the right framework for Vermont farmers. Uh, so with, uh, you know, the, the group was grateful for the extension, Act 129 and 2020 changed the name, which is, you know, what's in a name? A name is important, right? The, the first one was Soil Conservation Practice and Payment for Ecosystem Services. Um, Vermont and has a very uh, rich history of pay for practice programs, right? A, a, a financial assistance to implement cover crop as an example, up to 75 to 90 percent of the cost of implementing it, very effective. This group wanted to take a more holistic look at farming and think about performance outcomes. Think about what are the performance standards we want to set for agriculture and how to incentivize farmers to reach them and provide compensation for when they achieve those standards that exceed uh, a particular threshold or, or environmental standard. So the name was changed to the Payment for Ecosystem Services and Soil Health Working Group as soil health was the focus and the foundation from which these benefits are derived. Looking at soil as uh, a living, uh, interface, not just an inner media in which to stir it up, add fertilizer and seeds and grow stuff. It's a living um, organism and has to be stewarded as such. And so putting that concept of soil health front and center in the working group title uh, really set the stage for the conversations that were to come. Uh, also added a, a number of members, I'll run through those members in a second, uh, and then added a deliverable for a payment for ecosystem services report, which is due uh, to the Senate Committee on Agriculture and the House Committee on Agricultural Food Resiliency and Forestry uh, on Sunday. So we'll make sure to get that in on Friday, uh, but that will be a, 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 a quite a large report because there was a lot of research uh, but there is a specific recommendation for a program that I will get to, and uh, myself, uh, co-chair, uh, and other members and, and interested parties would be more than happy to come and talk about the program recommendation uh, and the plan that we have to, to implement the particular program. So I'm just going to give a quick preview and, and try not to uh, um, take too much time on this because it's a, it's a very all-encompassing uh, conversation. Um, we've shared two reports um, with you. Uh, okay, it just takes a second, gotcha. Um, we, sh we shared two reports, one was an interim report, uh, or two interim reports really, um, that focuses on um, what we've learned and where the group uh, thinks they're going, so those are just here for reference. Uh, there are 18 members on the working group representing um, a, a multitude of different organizations and interests. Uh, the, the list of the members are, are presented here. And we've had, you know, really committed participation uh, throughout this process. So this is a, a diagram that you'll see in a second that is one that we put up to try to describe well, what are we talking about when we talk about ecosystem services. 
Uh, we can think about food and fiber uh, as some ecosystem services that are provisioned by land uh, when they're stewarded by, by humans to, to cultivate the land to grow food and crops. Uh, depending on how land is managed, you can have numerous different outcomes, positive or negative, on pollination, air quality, water quality, aesthetic values, nutrient cycling, photosynthesis rates, right? But there, there is a, you know, ecosystems is meant to be a broad holistic term to speak about uh, the benefits that can be derived from management of agricultural soils. Uh, the <clears throat> Uh, General Assembly and, and this committee in particular work to appropriate a total of $1.25 million to this program uh, to deliver payments to farmers for qualified ecosystem services. And so what the working group has endeavored to do is provide uh, a recommendation and a program for how to do that. In total, the working group met 33 times since 2019 and that's not counting uh, the, the steering committee meetings or the subtask group meetings that were convened as a part of this group. So it was it was very active meeting basically every other Tuesday uh, to really dig into a lot of these questions. Um, the uh, also what was utilized uh, or the group identified the need for technical research uh, and University of Vermont uh, and their researchers were hired to explore those topic areas and they produced seven technical research reports which will, are available now and will be uh, appended to the report for consideration um, that look at a, a number of different areas include pricing, measurement, farmer survey and attitudes towards ecosystem services and payments. So trying to um, take a, again, a holistic look at uh, the components that we need to be strung together to A, accurately uh, measure and monitor the provisioning of ecosystem services, uh, and making sure it's uh, done so through a program that's efficient uh, and that also meets Vermont farmer goals. Um, and so that, that's what the technical contractor dug into and provided uh, seven very high quality reports. And that's in the report we're going to get next week? Yes, Senator. Uh, it is currently available on the website, uh, but it'll also be part of the uh, appendix. We'll have them all there for your uh, review. Um, and through this uh, working group process, we developed six pilot program concepts and analyzed them for a number of different criteria. Um, that's efficiency, benefit that goes to the farmer, cost to administer, um, anticipated uh, ecosystem service benefits, and, and ex those six example pilot programs will be uh, also outlined uh, in the final report. Uh, and then, you know, through all of that, uh, consensus was reached uh, among the membership of the Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group uh, to recommend by consensus a program uh, that will uh, enhance an existing federal program called the Conservation Stewardship Program. Uh, okay. No, I don't think that. Okay. Um, so, so it's an enhancement to uh, federal conservation stewardship program. Uh, it's going to incentivize farmers to enroll in the program and to accelerate and compensate uh, conservation through the farmer and adoption of practice enhancement required for CSP enrollment. Uh, the program is going to be a threshold-based program, uh, and it's going to use the Federal Conservation Assessment Ranking Tool uh, for the assessment. It's going to pay to plan to get into the program, and it's going to provide upfront incentive payments for implementation as part of the program. It's not going to focus on one specific resource concern at this time, but rather it's going to provide farmers flexibility within the confines of that program to address the enhancements and resource concerns that they most need to address. And it's going to provide, uh, and continuous improvement is going to be an important part of this program, including an end of first year review uh, to look at how it's working for uh, farmers and, and what's being, um, uh, what the benefit is from the program. So at the end of the five years, it's a five year program, right? So at the end of the five years, are you going to do soil analysis are all during those five years to see if soil's actually improving and retaining more water and less phosphorus and 
the measurement component of this program is going to come in in phase three. And so the tool that was selected, the CART tool, and the research that the agency has done on the companion tool, our set, shows that it is congruent with the state assumptions uh, and, and monitoring that has happened. And so the, the big discussion is, what is the cost to monitor and measure versus the cost to model? And how good is our data at this time to uh, rely on modeling tools to talk about the broader conservation effect? And so even before Act 64 2015, there's been significant uh, you know, water quality and other conservation monitoring that's been happening that gives us good confidence to say, if you're meeting the thresholds in this program, you are improving soil health. Uh, further research within the CART tool to say exactly how many tons of CO2 are abated uh, across the whole farm, uh, or how many pounds of phosphorus or pounds of nitrogen are, are reduced as part of loss is something that will come in phase three of the program. But each individual practice that is implemented through CSP will be reported to DEC and part of the state water state clean water reporting uh, framework. And so those specific practices will be counted as the whole farm assessment um, that directionally now is congruent with improving water quality and soil health. Those specific outcomes on a whole farm basis will take more time uh, to build that, that assessment framework. And, and so what you see on the board is, is confusing and, and, and detailed, but this was the output of the, yesterday was the last meeting of the Ecosystem Services Working Group, and this was the flow chart that was agreed upon for the program and how it's going to operate. Um, it, it, what's conceived here is uh, you know, the need for additional technical assistance. It was articulated that there is more need for uh, you know, agronomy professionals and conservation professionals to work with farmers to help support them to apply and enroll in the conservation stewardship program. And so that is what's one part of the proposal is to fund uh, that effort. Um, and then there is within the CSP program an acknowledgement that the planning that you need to do is significant before you can even get into the program. And so similar to the state's pay for phosphorus program, pay for performance program, providing uh, a planning incentive payment. So when you complete planning, uh, you are, th there's an incentive for doing so. And there's an explicit off ramp because the standards in this program are such where not every farm will qualify for CSP. And so if you go through the planning process, and let's say your farm needs to implement some cover crop or do, do some more crop rotations or, or work on that for a couple years, there's an off-ramp for programs, whether it's through NRCS, the state programs, or other technical financial assistance programs to support them to come up to the standards so that they can then enroll in the conservation stewardship program. Um, the next part is once they're accepted, they have to come up with a conservation plan to plan out five years of management rotation. That's a, a long time on farms that can get really complicated. And so as a, a, an enhancement to, uh, or an incentive to do this work, the program proposes to provide both a contract incentive payment uh, for doing that planning and getting to contracting, as well as to provide an upfront practice incentive payment. Uh, you may have to implement practices, or you do have to implement practices across your farm, not just in the cropland, to be eligible for CSP. And so this pr can provide some upfront funding to support them to implement those practices. In addition, NRCS also has program payment. So that is the bulk of the payment is going to come from the federal side in their conservation stewardship program. This, like many state programs, is working to kind of fill the gaps that have been, have been identified for Vermont farmers and how we can leverage that existing federal dollars and provide uh, an incentive uh, payment for, uh, to, to, get, to get farmers into the uh, so as I mentioned, this, what's been discussed is a, a phased uh, uh, program rollout. Uh, what we just looked at was phase one. Uh, big part of the charge as well as the goals of the working group are to next look at specific resource concern categories. So digging more into soil health, digging into biodiversity questions, digging into uh, explicit water quality considerations. Um, that is uh, an area that uh, there are uh, potential grants available in our sense that the state or other partners can apply for. 
uh, to bring in additional funding to support emphasis and reward for meeting particular resource concerns um, that are uh, uh, quantified within the CSP program. Go ahead. Uh, I've got to check out at 9.30 for a meeting, so I'm just curious, do we have a, when I think about schools in terms of education policy, which is my afternoon committee, I always think, all right, you know, this percentage of schools, things are going well, these are the schools that we really need to focus on. Do we have a sense of the number of farms or a percentage of farms that you feel are sort of moving in this good direction already with soils? And, you know, do you have a sense of, you know, farms that, you know, really, we need to sort of help them and focus on them? Is that sort of how you approach some of this stuff sometimes? Just help me as a yeah. new member. Yeah. A absolutely. So we do have all sides of the spectrum that yeah. have shared comments about this. I've been doing this all along. I don't have to do anything more. Yeah. Why am I never eligible for programs? Because you got to have a problem to fix it is a, is a common refrain. Okay. And so acknowledging that there are those stewards, those farmer stewards that have been doing this all along, and there are those that, for example, are, are doing good work, are meeting standards, but can do more. And so the CSP program is a good fit for those that have gone through the process of doing the regulatory compliance side, right? Meeting the meeting T, uh, tolerable soil loss, um, you know, complying with crop rotation and nutrient management standards. Like those are the type of things I, I would expect from a farm to be able to be eligible for CSP. And then of course you have the non-compliant farms, which still need to do even baseline work to get into compliance with the environmental standards that Vermont has set. And so that's that specific breakdown. Um, you, you'll get a presentation on kind of water quality compliance yeah. rates. And so I think that would be a, a, a good place to direct that, that question specifically about what does compliance look like and, and, and what are we doing. But to, to just kind of set the stage across Vermont since yeah. Act 64 2015, we've gone from less than 10% cover crop adoption rates to 48% last fiscal year right. across mm -hmm. all programs. And so that's a monumental right. uh, you know, improvement in conservation, which is reflective of a, the investments that the state have put into ag water quality work, uh, as well as the federal partners and, and, and all the programs. Um, so, so it's definitely on a very steep upward trajectory in my viewpoint. And this is uh, an attempt to A, provide recognition and compensate, compensation for those farms that have always been doing well, and also to incent you know, that next level of conservation stewardship. Um, and then uh, phase three will be uh, performance specific, more specific performance outcomes around specific uh, Vermont uh, environmental uh, conditions. And then there's my contact. Um, apologize for maybe taking it a bit more. That's the brief update. There's a lot more to dig into. So well, when, when we after we get that report, <clears throat> we'll have you back and and drill down, uh, you know, deeper, and uh, and go from there. Great, and uh, I'll make sure articulate there, there's a lot of members of the working group also that you know would like to be very interested to share um, their perspective as well. Yep, and I mean if- And, and members of the public too, of course. You, well, if Linda invites you, can you invite them if some of them want to come and-, and I'd, I'd be happy to share that, sorry, yeah, absolutely. Uh, because what we'll probably do is, um, it sounds like we might want to set couple of hours aside for the full report it at least and and uh, so that would be good Ryan yep Thank you. Uh, sure. so Abby uh, thanks Ryan uh, <coughs> would you like to go next yeah I'd be happy to I'd love to share a little bit about the Ag Development Division with the committee so again good morning all Abby Willard from the Agency of Agriculture and I'm the director of our Ag Development Division. <clears throat> uh, the Ag Development Division is one of the divisions at the Agency of Agriculture. We are a 21 staff division, so relatively small, uh, with a non-regulatory focus. But our agenda is to support Vermont's agriculture and food systems through a variety of ways. So we do a lot of grant making. We do marketing of Vermont products and Vermont businesses. Uh, strategic collaboration with lots of partners, a fair bit of strategic planning, thinking about the future of agriculture, and then connect businesses and partner organizations along the supply chain to critical resources. So mm -hmm. that could be to funding or technical assistance or business planning. So many of you are, are well aware and very familiar with 
the work of the Ag Development Division, but for, but for new committee members, that's sort of our overarching agenda. Um, the division really looks at opportunities for expanding markets. So helping businesses find new market opportunities for their products, whether that's within Vermont or throughout the country or even internationally. So we have a partnership with the Food Export Program that helps get Vermont products you know, to, to different countries and different cultures that are looking for our dairy, our maple, our, our value added and specialty products. We also are really looking for how businesses can grow or diversify and aim to become more viable. So one of the things that's become really clear to us and uh, about that agricultural community in Vermont, and I think speaks to the growth of the Ag Development Division over the last decade is this really close connection between economic viability of our communities and the health and viability of our agricultural economy. And businesses are changing and shifting and diversifying both what they produce and where they market their product and are really desperately in need of more support and more, more resources. We are known for bringing lots of federal funds into the state, both either to the Agency of Agriculture or support businesses as they apply for federal resources. Um, our division is organized into four sections. So the first being the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative, which is one of our signature programs. Um, we've had in, in, fiscal, <clears throat> excuse me, in fiscal year 22, um, the Working Lands Program made a significant growth in its allocation. So over $5 million last fiscal year and over $3 million in fiscal year 23. So historically, we'd had a relatively small but steady base allocation of under a million dollars, somewhere around 595,000. And it's been wonderful to see that signature program that has such an impact on working land. So both ag and forestry businesses see a real boost in its, its allocation of both base funds and access to ARPA dollars. So that's one of our divisions or one of our division sections the other is uh, focusing on marketing and exports. So that's where uh, we have programs that support our fairs and our field days, as well as the Vermont building at Eastern States, which we call the Big E down in West Springfield, Massachusetts. And the marketing and promotion of Vermont products and Vermont businesses across the country and internationally. It's also where our agritourism work occurs out of, which has become a far growing industry in the last couple of years and really recognized as one of the most rapidly growing areas of tourism in Vermont, which is agritourism. So these authentic experiences on farms and connected with farms and farming. Um, we also have a market development program, or, or excuse me, section, which has a variety of programs, including our farm to school and early childhood programming, uh, which is getting kids out onto farms and local food into the classroom and into the curriculum, as well as we receive a block grant of federal funds called the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program that's managed out of that section. So that's really investing in our produce industry, so fruits and vegetables, as well as maple and honey and Christmas trees. So some of those specialty crops that are not our typical commodities. Um, we also manage out of a few of those sections, some federal resources. So one is around um, marketing. Another is around support to the maple industry through USDA called ACER. Um, a third would be a relatively new program, which is called the Local Food Purchase Assistance Program, which is helping marginalized farmers sell their product to um, at risk and marginalized populations within the state. So very exciting new federal resources coming from USDA. It's managed yeah. out of the development section, uh, as well as some federal funds that are focused on um, increasing the amount of local food served in schools and a Northern Borders Regional Commission program that's providing infrastructure investment support to our food hubs. So looking at that supply chain and how do we aggregate product regionally from within Vermont and make sure that that product is making it out across the Northeast to retail and grocery and other wholesale accounts. And then hey, lastly, well, uh, 
Go ahead and finish up, Patty. And well, one last, one last section area that I wanted to focus on, um, and it's a big one um, and a really special kind of opportunity for the Ag Development Division and the Agency of Agriculture is the Northeast Dairy Business Innovation Center. So this was established a few years ago, and it's an 11 state region managed out of the Agency of Agriculture here in Vermont. And we've had almost $39 million awarded to this center for projects that will extend through 2026 in support of the dairy industry. Uh, so those are sort of like the major program areas that the Ag Development Division is responsible for. And, and Senator Starr, I, I heard you, so I, I wanna take a pause if there was a question that you had. Yeah, um, I was gonna ask, uh, uh, do you, one of these divisions, do you deal with uh, the amount of food that goes from farm to the schools for um, the uh, food lunch program? Um, and are we, is there something that we're missing there with having the food centrally uh, located, you know, geographically around the state and then dispersed uh, from say a food hub to the schools? Is there a distribution system that that's set up or is there a food system that needs set a uh, hub needs set up, uh, needs to be set up or? It's a great question, Senator Starr. I, we've been working on what we call farm to institution, which has been getting local food to K through 12 schools, to colleges and universities, into our healthcare systems and into our correctional facilities for 10 plus years. And we see a lot of, and I, when I say we, I would say the Agency of Agriculture, but also many partners have been working on this initiative and see a lot of potential in growing the amount of local food served in our institutions. And there are still many barriers it, and it depends upon the institution uh, to know what it is. So in schools, it might be that we're only feeding seasonally. So they're, they're not open and, and feeding kids typically throughout the summer. In colleges, it may be they are serving year round, but um, the volume has been difficult for farms to, to accommodate. Um, in correctional facilities, it's primarily been a price point, and as it has been in actually the K through 12 school systems also. But I would say the support of federal resources and state programs that have helped make, help overcome some of those barriers have been around price support. So making it more feasible financially for schools and other institutions to purchase local food. There's also been a significant investment in the infrastructure of food hubs, which are working with the for-profit distribution community to get that food to schools. And I feel like that's working really well. And we have a lot of that infrastructure established in the Northeast Kingdom, down in Brattleboro and Chittenden County and central Vermont. Um, so it feels like a lot of those historical barriers around distribution um, and kind of uh, relationship building have been um, overcome in, in the in the most in most cases. I think we still struggle with paying a fair price to the farmer and having it be affordable to the institution that's then trying to you know process that food and turn it into food at a really low price point for their their population. Um, I continue to think that this is an area of our food system that we're probably always going to have to make some investment and some subsidy in, especially if we believe in the value of feeding our kids and our and our um, other at-risk folks, whether they're living in a um, hospital or a, a, a long-term care facility or incarcerated. I think it's going to be something that we have to make a conscious decision that uh, it's both good for our ag economy to have that market, but also really good for those populations to have access to healthy, nutritious local food. So um, there's other partners that we work with and staff within the Ag Development Division that 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 kind of live and breathe our farm to institution work, which I'd love to have them share with you a little bit more. Um, we'll have a farm to school rep impact report ready in the next month that we'd be more than happy and intend to share with this committee to share some of the accomplishments and 
and really creative visioning work that's happening in that sector. So um, maybe we can continue that conversation in greater detail in the coming weeks. Well, I think, um, you know, that's uh, an issue that uh, I believe the committee is quite interested in working on and in trying to find ways to work with the industry and the agency and uh, promoting uh, uh, our homegrown products uh, so that, you know, for a few reasons, uh, you know, there's a supply chain problem getting stuff uh, or showed up uh, last year and, uh, you know, we've got we have young people that want to get into uh, producing, uh, you know, food for our own people. Uh, so I think the, you know, once the, we get going and the committee would like to hear from you and, and others um, in regards to what we might be able to do uh, to enhance that uh, happening. <coughs> Uh, We'd love uh, to do that, Senator. Yes. I, I think there's, it's a really, thinking about serving our local markets has a really feel good component. And it also, when we talk with producers, they want to feed their community. They, I mean, they want to be a viable business and they want to find markets outside of Vermont, but oftentimes they want to have a connection to their community, whether that's their school or their food shelves or their, the colleges in their, their county um, and, and really feel like they're, they're making a contribution. They, they spend so much time and energy growing and producing food to be able to then feed their neighbors and feed their community is really, really important to them. And we do that in a variety of, of ways. You know, we have farmers markets and farm stands and lots of direct to consumer opportunities. And that's where farm to institution or farm to school is one step removed because there's often a distributor um, or an aggregator in the mix to get the product to the to the final. Um. Yeah, um, Caroline. Thank you. Um, for the record, Caroline Gordon with Rural Vermont. Hi, Abby. Um, Happy New Year. I, I have two Thank questions uh, for you. Um, just bumping against that um, introductory statement that the development section is um, non-regulatory in its focus. Um, for the benefit of the committee, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, is that the direction of your division that's kind of set by the, by the governor? I, I know you are also active in the farm to plate um, policy team that's seeking to make policy recommendations to the state. That's, that's, I guess, one avenue where regulation is also being discussed, but also just internally, I wonder uh, who's assessing uh, the functionality of existing uh, programs. I, I, I'm just knowing that many of the programs the agency's administering, while they are uh, sort of supporting market development, they are a piece of regulation and surely there's um, shortfalls that farmers flag with those and I'm just wondering what's the internal process in place to kind of do those assessments or audits and make regulatory recommendations to this body on how to develop and improve them uh, with but also beyond market-based solutions. Yeah, Caroline, interesting question and, and actually a really great um, an important role that I think the Agency of Agriculture plays as a whole. I wouldn't say just the Ag Development Division. The reference to the Ag Development Division being non-regulatory, uh, my further explanation of that would be that we do not have as a division any statutory responsibilities to regulate or be uh, responsible for compliance of any sectors within the Ag community. And that is different than, than many of the programs within the Agency of Agriculture. But um, as an agency and <clears throat> across all of our divisions, we're really well known and respected as professionals that work with the industry, both to seek compliance and enforcement, but also development and opportunity and, and change and adjustment. There's a lot of technical assistance that happens across our agency. Um, and I think that, you know, EB and, and Ryan and Nina and other folks in the room, I think can really speak to a lot of, um, and Laura, who I see is on the, on the um, virtual meeting, can speak to a lot of that technical assistance that our programs provide. But more specifically to your question in the Ag Development Division, 
we do spend a fair amount of time thinking about policy adjustment, thinking about new program opportunities, soliciting information from our industry to learn where they're struggling, where they're finding success, where they are hoping for more resources and assistance. And we do that in a variety of ways. We've done that in surveys. So we do an annual where we're just beginning um, to have our second annual survey of the meat slaughter and processing community that are both the federally and state inspected um, slaughter and processing facilities to understand what their challenges are, what their hiring and vacancy challenges are, and where resources could be valuable to them around their infrastructure. Uh, we're launching with our, um, our public health and ag resource management division, a hemp industry survey um, to get a sense of what is the hemp industry experiencing right now in the needs of policy or program development or resource support. And that's a one strategy of just sort of doing reach outs to the industry um, in, in the form of a survey. We also worked diligently with the um, Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund two years ago during the pandemic in creating the Ag and Food System Strategic Plan. And I believe that this committee will have an opportunity hopefully in the coming, um, I think on Friday even to hear from Ellen and Jake about the Ag and Food System Strategic Plan. And you'll hear about the you know, 1500 different Vermonters that were a part of that plan and all the effort that was put into thinking about the priority recommendations for enhancing the viability of agriculture and our food system. Um, that looks at policy recommendations and our agency was a, a you know, kind of a hand in glove partner with VSJF as they engaged and led that process. Um, the governor established the Future of Ag Commission through executive order two years ago and that 12 member commission spends significant amount of time. So they meet at least 12 times a year and address and learn and think and strategize around what are some important opportunities and programs and policy and investments for the future of agriculture. So they submitted a report to the governor's office this past November and the previous November. So the 2021 plan submission is public and available on our website and I'm happy to share it and use it as a as a you know kind of a talking points for where we found opportunity in the in the ag community. And hopefully, you know, following the governor's budget address, I, I suspect that that report from November of 2022 will also be released with a um, kind of like a further enhanced set of recommendations uh, that came out of that commission's work. So again, engaging in these public processes and partnerships are other ways that we're looking at policy and new program investment opportunities. Yeah, thank, thank you, Abby. Uh, Diane, did you want to add something? I think Abby covered it really well. Um, thank you, Senator. I, I was just going to pretty much echo what she said, but I think the other aspect of our regulations that we've been interacting with um, the legislature as well as um, organizations outside of state government to discuss those regulations, but they do open up markets within state and out of state. Meat inspection, dairy inspection, if you're passing that inspection, you can market your products anywhere, anywhere. And so it's not, you know, so that, those are important aspects as well for those who want to market within state, but also out of state or internationally. So the, the regulations that we have and that we um, have in our regulatory aspects also open markets uh, within and beyond state borders and also beyond our international borders. Mm -hmm. So those are important as well for, for folks who want to market at that scale. Yeah. Um, any other quite anything else, Abby, that you want to add at this point, or, or are you all set? I think I'm I'm all set. I I would just actually maybe I guess two additional points. I just to give a con some context. Um, the Ag Development Division last fiscal mm -hmm. year awarded over ten point four million dollars in grants and contracts through about a dozen different programs to our ag community. So just to give you a sense of the amount of money that's both coming into Vermont and that this year, you know, this body, the legislature has been um, involved in bringing resources to our ag community has been really appreciated. When I looked at um, the Future of Ag Commission uh, 
kind of action plan from last year, I think there was over three and a half million new dollars that came to the Agency of Agriculture and the Ag Development Division, and then an additional five plus million that came in the work that, that Ryan Patch spoke of. So payment for ecosystem services and climate smart. So that's a significant amount of resources that we keep pumping into the ag economy. And yet still, you know, I just want to acknowledge that we see businesses struggle to be viable. We see people continue to be hungry and we still have, you know, conflict and concern around how our natural resources are being managed and how neighbors are perceiving the farmers in their community. So while I think we all work hard at both supporting businesses, building community understanding and appreciation for agriculture, the work, the work continues. And I, and I don't think, uh, I don't think we're done yet. Um, yeah. At the end of this week, you'll have two reports that, that I have been a part of, and I think there's probably others coming from the agency. So one would be um, kind of an initiative led by the Natural Resources Board, uh, looking at accessory on-farm business and Act 250 opportunities for the ag community. So some really strong recommendations there around how we can support businesses as they diversify and look for new opportunities to kind of retain more of that consumer dollar for the benefit of their business. And then the second would be um, actually that resulted out of a conversation that happened in this committee last year, Senator Starr was around new and aspiring farmer resources. And so we worked with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board and did a pretty, a a pretty lengthy stakeholder engagement process to put together some new and beginning farmer support suggestions for this committee. Um, as well as we've created a new farmer resource page at the Agency of Agriculture. So we'll share all those resources with you once you get the report by Friday. Um, it may make sense to, to come in and speak to those, those opportunities very specifically. Yeah, well, uh, I look forward to having a group in and, and go through that report and see, you know, what, what the next step is on our part to help you folks uh, move that uh, forward. Um, any other questions for Abby from the committee? We'll sit down. Uh, thank you, Abby. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Nice to see you all. Yeah. Um, so who would like to go next? Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, my name is Stephen Cornell. I'm the, uh, as I said before, I'm the director for the Public Health and Agriculture Research Commission. Uh, I'm new to the agency and to the state. Moved here in July from Florida. Um, after moving here, was con I was working in private industry at the time. I was contacted about this position. You know, the care some of you all may know Carrie's uh, year. He was the director. He's one that actually contacted me and said, "Hey, this position's coming open." And I applied and was selected. And I'm so you very happy to be here. You took uh, Carrie's place, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Trying to take his place. I am never going to be able to take Carrie's place. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, yeah. we still talk to Carrie all the time. But yeah. um, uh, my background, just for context, I'm an entomologist um, specializing in integrated pest management and agricultural pest management, structural pest management. Worked in private industry and conducting environmental fate studies and in uh, the structural pest management industry, but also was with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Conservative Services for about 30 years, doing administering pro very similar programs, the fertilizer program, the seed program, the feed program, the pesticide program, the structural pest management, and the mosquito control program. Yeah. So got a lot of similar experiences. This division, and just to, you know, for the, for the new members, and just to put it in context again, this division is a small division. We have 19 full-time employees and seven seasonal but we're responsible for 13 statutes and all the associated rules in program areas, uh, feed, seed, fertilizer, pesticides, pest management activities, mosquito control, uh, uh, apiary, apiary industry. Uh, we also, the public health portion of the, of the division revolves around the mosquito control activities, but also we, we uh, have a program to survey uh, for arboviruses 
uh, both transmitted in arboviruses, this are arthropod borne viruses, and other diseases, and that's for mosquito in mosquitoes and in ticks. So we have a surveillance program and a mosquito surveillance program. That's the, the seasonal part. One thing I forgot to mention in our, our list of responsibilities is the nursery industry and the, the plant production industry for yep. uh, landscaping. And uh, that's a big part of it and becoming a more important part of what we do. And as part of that, we also have a role in uh, monitoring for invasive species, insects, diseases, and weeds. And so we've got a big role in that. And I have my two deputy directors here with me because like I said, I'm new, I'm still on the upper part of the learning curve here. And so I'm glad they're here and they can uh, talk about individual, you know, their, their parts of their program in more detail, which I'll do in a minute. But the one thing I wanted to mention for the committee is the activities of the Agricultural Innovation Board, yeah. which was an important committee that was established uh, in 2021 and started their work in 2022. Uh, we the board has met six times in 2022. We just uh, submitted the annual report on Monday to the legislature. Uh, we are working toward, there are 13 members that are appointed by the secretary. Um, and the, you know, we have a soil scientist, we have farmers, we have a certified crop consultant, we have a dairy industry representative. There, you know, we have a, a University of Vermont Extension. Um, and what we're, Working toward now, as dictated by the legislature, is we have to produce a set of recommendations for best management practices for uh, seeds that are treated, treated seeds, but not seeds that are treated with neonicotinoids, because that was one of the big concerns. And then we have a further chart in March of 2024 to provide a set of recommendations for the neonicotinoid treated seeds. Yeah. So we're working you know, <clears throat> toward that. Yeah, we, uh, we've already had some inquiries into our pollinators and yes. and how that's going. And is that part of oh, yeah. the report? Uh, well, it, it, it's part of the committee's jurisdiction. Well, to look yeah, into not, not just the committee, but also our division, you know, yeah. because we, we do the apiary management and we have an environmental survey program that we're looking at various aspects of that. but. Um, as an entomologist, uh, you know, my graduate work involved pollinators, so I'm very interested in that whole area, and we have some resources we can, we can devote to that. Seems like last year, we, or the year before. No, it was last year, right near the end of the year session. Last year, we did some yep. work on that. Yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, you know, once we get rolling, uh, you know, we'll uh, plug in some time to go over the report that Yes, uh, committee because we revamped that whole committee if I remember right mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to yeah. get more get it more balanced uh, mm -hmm. I guess uh, I might say and uh, there there seems to be still some questions from our friends in the Senate and, and, yeah uh, it's a very, about yeah. protecting our pollinators and mm -hmm and making sure that we're doing what we can to uh, yeah. keep them. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's something we think about all the time and yeah. we're, we're looking at. Um, and with that, let me go and turn it over to Dave Hubert, Deputy Director, and he'll talk yeah. about the, his part for me. Sure. Uh, yeah, well, good morning, members of the club. Uh, Senate Ag. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Dave Huber, uh, Deputy Director of uh, the Public Health and Agricultural Resource Management Division, as Steve was just mentioning. Uh, last time I was in this room was walking Senate Education through the Daycare Unionization Bill back as Legislative Council back in 2013, so it's kind of interesting to be back in this room. Uh, I haven't been before you uh, to testify, so I just want to introduce myself and a little bit of my background as well. Uh, Steve just did. Um, I used to prosecute cases with the uh, Maryland Attorney General's Office Environmental Crimes Unit. Uh, did defense uh, work uh, at, a, at a small boutique for, for some environmental cases. Uh, worked over at Legislative Council, had worked over at Department of Labor um, in Vermont. Uh, and then for the past seven years have been with the Agency of Agriculture working with uh, folks here before you. 
Uh, the first six of those years was as a chief policy enforcement officer doing enforcement work for water quality and for the uh, farm division. Uh, so if you have any questions about uh, any sort of enforcement work, don't hesitate to ask. Um, and in fact, that's gonna be the bulk of what I would be uh, touching upon today is uh, some enforcement work for the farm division. Um, additionally, uh, just for your awareness, uh, there's a, uh, a training group called NEEP, the Northeast Environmental Enforcement Project. I'm vice chair of their board of directors. It helps to set uh, the training protocols for uh, member organizations, which span from Ohio to Maine down to West Virginia. We're included. Vermont Agency of Natural Resources is also a member. Uh, we have been since 2016. Um, additionally, uh, there's a group called the uh, Association of Structural Pest Control Regulatory Officials. I'm a member of two of their committees. Uh, the first is Integrative Pest Management, uh, which is acronymized as IPM, but I'll spell down Integrative Pest Management in Schools Committee, as well as their Inspector Training Committee, which helps to train uh, inspectors from all 50 states. So there is a, a good finger on the pulse of training from the Agency of Agriculture as it relates to pesticide uh, regulatory officials across all 50 states and, uh, and, and even more uh, within our Ohio to uh, the Northeast quarter of Ohio to Maine down to West Virginia. Um, additionally, there's another group called the Pesticide Regulatory Education Program that's prep. They work with uh, EPA, and uh, with them, I also am on a planning committee, which helps to set all the trainings for uh, this current 2023 year for pesticide uh, regulatory officials. Uh, so the Agency of Agriculture tries to help out as much as we can with our expertise on pesticides uh, and how we can help train others uh, do the same. Did either of you, Dave, get in on the, I believe Elkar just had a meeting and uh, they postponed action on the railroad using certain pesticides for their tracks, was it? Was it that one that? Not at Elkar. No? Uh, Elkar we have, right now we have the pesticide regulations and 91 regs, those are going through Elkar currently and we're scheduled to be back in attendance on January 19th. Yeah, so. You know, well, right away permits for our railroads and AMC transportation is something that we administer mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that involve, you know, we put restrictions on the materials that can be used. If, if I'm not aware of another hearing on that, but if, we can find, we'll certainly look into that. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. It seems as though I read something, <clears throat> you know, they, they spray the yeah. tracks so that the grass doesn't, and seems like they ran into a snag uh, at the- uh, we'll, we'll certainly look into that, that, that definitely. Yeah. We, we just actually, actually had- I think it was maybe uh, A&R that was- Okay. Questioning at some parts of it. Okay, well, we'll, we'll definitely yeah, look check into that. that out. Yeah, yes, sir, sure. thank you. And, because uh, they, they like, uh, a and R likes bullying in on ag stuff as much as they can. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, look into that. Um, sure. the, uh, so are there are other questions nope. for either Dave or Dave or Steve? Steve. Yeah. I'd like to go into a, a little more detail if you sure. like. Uh, otherwise, I'll pass the baton. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know, Stephanie, but you want to go next or? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. I'm just gonna provide some updates, um, just ge broad general information about the programs that I manage within the Public Health and Agricultural Resource Management Division. Um, so I manage the individuals that do um, feed, seed, and fertilizer product registration. Um, and that is a primarily a consumer protection program to ensure that what's on the label of one of those products is met um, through testing. So broadly, that's what it is. Uh, for feed alone, the agency registers over 10,000 products. Um, and those feed products include commercial feeds, pet feeds, pet treats, 
dosage form animal health products. Um, and I can't remember the other one. But, but, so, but it's a wide variety of products that the agency um, registers. Again, also fertilizer, which includes soil amendments, plant amendments, bi plant biostimulants, um, and fertilizer products. Um, and we do testing, we take samples. So the field agents that Dave manages um, go out into the field, take samples of these products. And then we take them to the Vermont Ag and Environmental Lab, and situated between the people in which <laughs> the chain moves. Um, and uh, they get tested to ensure that they meet those label requirements. And so that's one program um, that I'm responsible for. There's the food residual program. We turned in our annual report on Friday, maybe, of last week. Um, the food residual program is uh, enabled under Chapter 218 in Title VI. And it is it enables farms to import um, food residuals, which include both um, food waste, post-consumer food waste, pre-consumer food waste, and food processing waste onto farms for them to uh, compost and build soil. Um, we- May I ask you a quick question regarding this while she's chatting? Sir, happy to take a question. Yeah, just, <laughs> so I remember this came up a little bit with some constituents around their chicken farm, the yeah. food residuals. What, what Did that ever get resolved? Do you remember that situation? Can yeah. So, yeah, so it, this is a new program. Yeah. Um, and that integrates into the program that the agency has. Okay. And so if you are importing um, 2,000 cubic yards or less of yeah. these food residuals onto your farm, and you manage a certain amount of chickens, or if you use a primary, um, compost that material and use it primarily on your farm, then it is considered quote unquote farming. Okay. Um, and that is a part of the uh, definition, integrated with the definition of farming within the RAPs. Thank you, sorry yes. to So yes, um, and so we are, we haven't gone through rulemaking yet for this program. Um, we're still taking in information. So uh, in the middle of 2022, we hired a new individual to help us um, do this work. And thankfully that was part of 2022 budget, so we have that individual. Um, we have, we are no, we know approximately 15 farms that um, engage in this process of varying scales. Um, the agency has participated in two outreach events um, with the Composting Association of Vermont um, to talk about what our standards might be um, and to engage with those that are engaged in this practice and to learn information from them. We've done five site visits um, to make sure that what we're doing when we go through the rulemaking process that we're not adopting unreasonable standards that can't be met on farms that are currently engaged in this practice. Um, so we're taking in a lot of information um, and it's, it's going really well and um, we're, we're actually submitting a proposal for a conference coming up um, in May. So we continue to engage with constituents. Um, I manage the hemp program, um, but we are transitioning away uh, I want to mention that Abby said that we did a market survey study. That survey is out. We sent it to all of our hemp participants um, in 2022 to gather information about gaps and challenges that those individuals might see in the hemp market in the state of Vermont. Um, the state of Vermont has, from the growing perspective, has turned over this program to the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, and if an individual in the state of Vermont wishes to grow hemp, in 2023, they must register with USDA to do so. So the cannabis board is not going to do hemp, or this is. Um, I'm not going to get into what the cannabis control board is or isn't doing. I'll let them speak to that. But what I can say is that if an individual wants to grow a federally compliant <clears throat> crop that can cross state boundaries they must be registered with the federal government to do so. Okay, what about, and there's a couple of people that want to build uh, two different manufacturing facilities for hemp, one, one in St. J and one down lower. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as they buy hemp or our farmers that want to grow him take it there who do they deal with vermont or the feds so if an individual wants to grow hemp um, for fiber they would register with usda and the um but the manufacturing business does not have to register with usda uh, but the growers would have to register with usda to grow fiber hemp indeed 
and, and what is the reason for that? Um, the, well, so there's some benefits that farmers will see. Um, they will, they don't have to pay a registration fee with, to the agency. Um, we, it, they, it's a free registration at this point in time. They obviously have other costs that they'll have to endure, buying seed, getting equipment, labor, so on and so forth. Um, it is a three-year registration with the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, they will be able to use for their potency test to determine whether or not that crop is compliant. They can use a lab anywhere located in the United States. They don't have to use any labs located in the state of Vermont. Um, so there's some, some benefits there. And there are some states that, well, never mind, that's, not a, that's no longer an issue. That aside, but we did we we turned over our program to the to USDA, and we've done a tremendous amount of outreach to all of our growers to make sure they're aware of it. Currently, the state of Vermont has three growers that are registered with USDA. We've had meetings. We brought USDA to the state of Vermont. We met in Cornwall, and it was a warm November night, I think. <laughs> we, um, I mean, we in this building spent a lot of time setting that program up. And uh, I know it kind of fell on its ears. We, we uh, had a lot more growers than we had uh, processing and, and uh, facilities to handle it. But if, if they get going on the fiber, it, I mean, I can't see where that would be any different crop than growing oats or barley or wheat or, you know, it's just one more crop that that would be available <coughs> to utilize our, our land. Uh, That's a true statement. Uh, but the growers that are in, in business, they were all in agreement with letting the feds take that over or? We did not hear any complaints. The standards are the same, whether the state of Vermont was administering the standards for an application requirement or USDA was. Um, and certainly, it, because there's no cost currently to register with USDA, that is, we were charging, you know, between 25 for a personal grower through $3,000 for an indoor um, over 500 square feet of growing. Um, so. That, that's a cost savings to some extent. Um, and it, the, again, the registration is for three years. It's not an annual registration. So if someone was growing over 5,000 or 500 square feet for three years, that would be $9,000 to register with us. Whereas with USDA, it, there's no cost yeah. at this um, time. I can't speak for what may happen. Well, <clears throat> yeah, and I, I think we all thought at the time that it was going to be a uh, real thriving business and uh, there was going to be some money to be made and we sort of set it up these registration fees to cover the cost of having the inspections done and the testing done and, and all that but uh, but anyways, uh, I want to say though that it, it is a thriving industry in the state of Vermont. That that is, we have many, many, many growers that are making money in this business, and we have the fiber um, processor located in St. J. And I think Proctor. Proctor or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're interested in expanding their market. They had a fiber grower that grew six acres for them last year, um, who intends on growing 50 acres for them this year. So. I, I think there's still tremendous opportunity. We have lots of successful businesses. The fact that the agency is getting out of administering this program should not be a reflection on the industry itself in the state of Vermont. Yep. Uh, other, anything else? Um, the nursery program that Steve mentioned, I'm not going to go into that again. It, um, it, that we, we manage nurseries and we ensure that invasive pests um, are, don't get treated. <laughs> um, and then the pesticide certification and training program, as well as pesticide registration, um, we do that as well within the um, division. Uh, and um, yeah, so the pesticide certification and training program, um, we ensure that individuals that are using, I think, uh, restricted use pesticides are properly trained to ensure mis uh, that misapplications don't happen. Um, and there's 11 categories, I'm looking to my fellow uh, colleagues here, 11 categories, um, and 
it, it, you know, for instance, um, tree forest um, pesticide spraying. So, the, you know, we ensure that the people that are doing those activities, um, potentially for uh, spongy moth, um, that they are certainly educated in order to make those applications and don't put the um, public health and safety at risk, as well as those food industries that use, that apply for rodents. Um, and that, again, protects public health and safety in those applications. And so we, well, we ensure they're educated to ensure that rodents aren't, Everything. you know, in the industry or in commercial businesses. Um, so thank you. Uh, and may I ask one question? One. <laughs> Is there a pesticide rule that's happening right now? People keep chatting about it. Do you know anything about that? Can you just, as a new member, can you just tell me a little bit? Steve, Steve yeah, you'll have to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. You'll have to take that up after the <laughs> okay. and, 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 and as a side note, anytime anybody has any questions about anything personally, please reach out to us. Like so it is in the process. So we have a rule that Dave worked very hard on. For, for quite a while, and it's at the end stage now at El Crozet hearing coming up January 19th. January 19th. And any details you want, we'd be glad to go into as much depth as you want. I appreciate that. Thank you. In the apiaries, they do the uh, pollinators. Yeah. Group, and and uh, so, uh, Stephanie, uh, you mentioned the fertilizer and uh, feed testing. Yeah. How how is that all working out? Or are you finding most of the samples to be accurate? Uh, uh, or do you know? So, uh, and that's why we do testing. Um, the my understanding for the hold on a second, I have numbers here. Um, for fertilized samples in 2022, 95 were collected. Um, 336 chemical analyses were done for nitrogen, available phosphorus, potash, and numerous secondary nutrients such as calcium, magnesium, sulfur, so on and so forth. Um, and 26 of those fertilizer products failed. So that's uh, you know a little bit. That's 27 percent uh, for fertilizer. They failed. They on failed it. because they didn't have the right ingredients in the bag or they failed because of, of some of the ingredients were wrong? They failed to meet the label claim, the guarantee on the fertilizer product. Wow. That's not a very good score, about 72 or 3 percent, but it's not. Yeah, 27. Um, and the process is uh, we do send out Letter, if, if there's a penalty that meets a certain threshold, we send out letters to the provider of the fertilizer, and they have to pay a certain amount of money to the farmer huh. um, to make them whole for the for the deficiency. Yeah. So that's that's for the fertilizer, and on the feed, um, 177 feed samples were taken in 2022. Uh, 910 chemical analyses were run by the Vermont Ag Lab, um, Ag and Environmental Lab, uh, and those uh, they're looking at protein, fat, fiber, moisture, and secondary nutrients, and then 20 of those failed. 64 passed and 67 were within tolerance. So there's a tolerance yeah. um, piece there. And then uh, there's, we have 26 are still in progress. So we still have some samples. That, but you I had 22 that failed? 20 that failed. 20. Yep. Oh, that's a lot on, Potentially on protein, potentially on fat, and potentially on fiber. Yeah. It's not, yeah. So it's, um, it's incremental actually made and, Okay, I'm not putting you on the spot, but I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> sure. um, yeah, so failing at least one of those parameters. One of those prime parameters, correct. It would be helpful if we got that in writing, so. Well, you do a report. We do a report. I would be happy to share that with you. Yeah, or a link to the report, or yeah. I don't know how long the report is. It would be, if there's a synopsis to the yep. report, that would be nice. Yes, we have the executive summary and then we have that would be all awesome. the analysis. If we could get the executive summary. Great. See, both, both of those issues are, um, products are very expensive. And uh, so it's important to keep those standards met. And, and, uh, uh, 
Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Senator. Again, for the record, Caroline Gordon with Rural Vermont. Um, Stephanie, just back on on farm composting of food residuals, um, Act 41 from 2021 and Section 8A spelled out that the agency shall file a final proposal of the rules on or before January 1st of this year. Uh, I was briefly looking over the Friday report and I was I think I was missing kind of an outlook of when we would, might see um, that filing for the rule. Yeah, we so we prospectively have not put in a prospective date for mobile filing. We'll we continue to meet with farmers and learn um, and make adjustments. So we yeah, we have not um, produced a final copy of the rule as of yet. It's still in a draft form. Um, and we're working closely with our um, with the water quality division as well in that conversation. So yeah. Yeah. We've been at Rural Vermont working with the poultry farmers for compost foraging for many years on this issue and we've uh, submitted draft rules um, early last year and you all hopefully understand that any kind of market development for this innovative act practice is stalled in promotion until a rule can be adopted. So um, we would like to see this move rather sooner than later so we don't lose another summer in getting the word out. Yeah, is that something you're working on? So we work very closely with the Composting Association of Vermont, and they have drafted guidance, um, and we've reviewed that guidance. And generally, we would because this is a farming activity, all the setbacks associated um, with uh, surface water and groundwater yeah. and composting on bedrock, all those standards that currently exist in the RAPs would be the guidance that we would provide to any person engaging in this activity because it's considered farming. Um, so we do have. Uh, that information and that's it's that's clear um, and I'll let Laura interrupt me if, if <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm just curious, Laura Demetra, I just say that. Caroline, what were you referencing a date? We don't have a date in the statute. In Act 41, Section 8A, that has not been adopted in the Chapter 218, as I can see online. Right, yeah, so it's not a date. But it's in, it's in the Act that passed. And that's a true statement, yes. If there is a date um, that it was to be adopted by. And we have not had that date. Okay. Yeah. So that's something you're working on. We're working on, and again, we're we're working with the folks that are engaged in this um, activity. Uh, we are providing guidance both through the Composting Association of Vermont, and then also we reference the RAPs, uh, the required agricultural practices. Um, so. While we don't have rules in place, we're working towards rules, and we want to make sure that they're not unreasonable for the activities, because people are engaged in this already and have been well before the passage of Act 41. Um, so we want to make sure that whatever we adopt is meets the, the needs for um, environmental you know, safety and compliance, um, as well as addressing nuisances, but also takes into consideration those farmers that are doing this work. And so we've begun to do that work by reaching out and doing site visits. So we're active. I want to say that we are in there. <laughs> we're talking to people. Well, um, yeah. So thank you. I know the last couple of years things have been crazy to try to get done and meet and, and uh, with the pandemic and everything. But, um, but overall, the composting situation is working quite well. Folks, uh, for so the small farms. We have approximately 15 farms that are engaged in this activity. Um, at least four of them have actual certifications from the Agency of Natural Resource. Um, uh, so they have standards built into that certification. Um, and then we also we have a list of smaller farms that are engaged in the activity, and a majority of them are actually composting, and they're not selling into the marketplace. They're just building soil on their own on farms. Their own yeah, farm. um, and they're fairly small, but yeah. Yeah. It, we're out there, we're talking to them, and we're, we're gathering information, um, and hopefully it will address their challenges and assist in their development, so, yeah. yeah. Um, so, anything else, Stephanie? No? Um, I think probably before we start our uh, next uh, witness, uh, maybe we should take a little break maybe sure uh, 10 minutes or right. in and uh, you know if you want to get up and walk around or whatever uh, so we'll come back uh, 25 hours 
Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You raise a well, Brian? Wonderful, yeah, no, thank you for your time, Senators. Uh, so I have a couple, uh, just two short uh, slides here, so let me just share my screen here for a moment. So, so thanks again for your time today. So I just wanted to give a very brief uh, introduction to the Vermont Agriculture and Environmental Laboratory um, so that you can understand what happens in that space and a little bit about our activities. Uh, so we occupy a facility that's on the uh, Vermont Tech campus in Randolph Center. Uh, so we're fortunate to have a building that's relatively newly commissioned uh, back in 2019 that provides fairly state-of-the-art uh, testing capabilities. Uh, so when we think about the Vermont Ag and Environmental Laboratory, there's really kind of two ways to look at that. On one hand, uh, you can focus on the analytical lab. That's our testing capabilities, the stuff that we can do and generate data on that informs a, a whole host of projects, uh, both from the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, as well as the Agency of Natural Resources, um, as well as the building itself. So the laboratory space itself, which is not only home, to the variety of analytical testing labs, uh, but also home to a number of very important programs, and many of which have been represented in the room here, as well as uh, folks from the Agency of Natural Resources, uh, looking at the uh, Department of Environmental, excuse me, the DEC, as well as uh, Fish Health, um, also our home to weights and measures, so the folks who do all the pump calibrations and maple syrup hydrometers and everything in between. So it's a, it's a very collaborative space. Um, it's a very engaging space to be in. And as long as our steam is functioning, uh, we're able to do a lot of good work. Um, so just a little bit about the lab and some of the activities that happen specific to the, the analytical spaces. So we run over 30,000 analytical tests a year. Uh, we have a staff of 14 full-time employees and uh, we're approved uh, with over a hundred different testing methods. And so we have a really broad spectrum of testing capabilities. And in each case, uh, we strive to provide quality data. So we have, I'm very proud of the, the systems in place at the lab that are for quality assurance purposes, meaning that the work that goes into developing the testing methodology to actually running the test and then reporting it out is very defensible. So it's, it's robust, it's reliable, so that that data can inform uh, good action. Uh, we're a nationally accredited lab. Uh, we participate in a number of processes internally and externally that keep us in good standing. So some of the different testing activities that we do on a day-to-day -day basis at the lab include work with uh, milk and dairy products. So this is everything from uh, product quality as well as consumer safety. So looking at antibiotics, looking at bacteria, looking at uh, pasteurization, looking at milk fat content, so a wide array of parameters, again, from a quality or a safety standpoint. Uh, cyanotoxins, I'm sure some of you have heard about blue-green algae and the impacts that can have on the state from a drinking water perspective as well as our recreational waters. And so this past year, the lab took on responsibilities for testing for the toxins that those algae uh, produce and it's likely that we'll grow that testing capability here in the coming season. Um, as uh, Stephanie had mentioned uh, before, uh, we do a number of feed, seed, and fertilizer testing. So again, from a, a label guarantee perspective, making sure that what's in the package is what they say is in the package. Um, so we report those out uh, from the samples. We also take pet food analysis. So any manufacturer who's gonna sell pet food in the state goes through a, symbol, a similar um, label guarantee process. Again, making sure that it's, it's a quality product and that what's on the label, the consumer can rely on that. Uh, from a pesticide standpoint, uh, we're very actively engaged uh, with Steve and his team. Uh, we participate in two key areas with pesticides. One is our routine analyses, and so these are brought about through specific projects, whether it's a neonicotinoid or it's glyphosate, but looking at some of the ripple effects, looking at how those are being utilized and where those products are going. Um, we also get heavily involved if there's any misuse investigations. Uh, so in the case 
of a complaint that gets a, that comes to the agency. We respond. We provide uh, a chain of custody process for the samples so that we have defensible data to either inform that the complaint is valid or to invalidate it. Um, so that's where we get involved. Um, we have tens of thousands of, of water quality samples that we receive. So virtually any of Vermont's lakes and streams and other bodies of water, we're doing uh, data analyses to inform whether there's phosphorus runoff, uh, other types of nutrients, metals, bacteria, uh, presence or absence of pesticides. So really, again, trying to monitor and inform for keeping our, our bodies of water uh, safe. And then from an air quality standpoint, we're involved with an ET EPA testing process that evaluates air quality um, in all the states. And so for the Vermont state component, uh, we accept those samples and evaluate those for air toxics and heavy metals. And of course, pleased to say we have some very good air. Where, where do those, uh, those samples come from? So there's air quality, <laughs> who collects them? It's a great question. So we, we work uh, with a, the collection partner, uh, Jenny Bershling, and the uh, Agency of Natural Resources. So they do the collections through the mandated processes. There's designated sites throughout the state. Oh, um, oh there are designated? Correct. So they can, it's a, basically, it's year round. It's on a, I think it's a 12 day schedule. So every 12 days we get a sample in. Oh, and yeah. so they can get a very uh, accurate picture yeah. of quality over time. And is there a certain time of year that we have better air quality than others, or do you know, do that's you a, know that? Uh, Senator, that's a great question. I wish I could tell you that off the top of my head. I, I don't know without looking at the data. And, and typically in this case, you know, this would be data that we're the intermediary. So we would generate the quality data. We give the report to um, the, the collector, the, in this case, Jenny, and then she's able to anal analyze that and determine how we're doing in terms of our, our air quality. Yeah. Uh, seems like in that, like this morning, you know, it was really cold and brisk. It seemed like the air was pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it felt good going once. <laughs> <laughs> Brian? No problem. Uh, Thanks, Senator. Uh, do you test for DEC? What's your relationship there? Do they ask you guys to test things, or these things that you're all sort of testing, on, like for ANR? What's that sort of relationship, I guess? So, Senator, that's a great question. So, the lab is is, is run through the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets, but okay. it's in collaboration with the Agency of Natural Resources, Got it. which the DEC is part of. Got it. Um, so, we, we strive to serve both needs of both agencies. So are you the lab for the state, for for example, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, PCDs, you're, you're the lab that we're, that we go to. And I guess my other question, we just, uh, Senator Starr, a few of us were up at UVM visiting some folks. What's your, how do you work with UVM in terms of testing and that kind of thing? Do you do much with UVM? So Senator, that's a great question. So there's two areas in which we get involved. Um, from a testing standpoint, uh, UVM right now is handling a lot of the soil testing okay. for agricultural quality. For, so, for you, for, for your agency? Well, it's not through us directly, it's okay. for the Vermonters. Got it. So we just, that's kind of their their, their area of expertise. Got it. And their capacity is, is developed there for that. Okay. So they uh, handle that part of it. Uh, the other area where we engage has been with collaboration with uh, researchers and faculty members there. So, for instance, there's some work potentially for this coming season uh, with neonicotinoids and how they might move okay. through the soil. And so we're collaborating uh, with a faculty member there at UVM to Great. potentially get some of that testing. Thank they, you. They've done soil tests forever. Um, yeah. And, uh, through the extension yeah. and, and it's just stayed there. We just we had a great tour and a lot of it was focused on ag stuff and it's just incredible what some of the students are producing. Mm -hmm. yeah. This committee had a great tour last year of the testing lab. We, oh really? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. I, I see Diane has a question. Mr. Yeah. Chair. All right. I didn't see you up there in the corner, Diane. <laughs> I know, I'm stuck in the corner. I can't help it. Uh, but thank you, Senator, uh, to, to elaborate on Glenn's answer around the laboratory and our interactions with uh, a and uh, Agency of Natural Resources and the Department of Environmental Conservation. When the lab uh, came together 
was to be built in the statute, it states we'll have a, um, an MOU and a lab governance board. Um, so that governance board is made up of members from the Agency of Agriculture and the Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, Secretary Moore and Secretary Tebbets are both involved and alternate as, as chairing that governance board. Um, so there's a lot of interaction and um, a lot of discussion. Glenn is in the middle of a strategic planning of where trying to figure out what's next. You know, these things keep coming up of PFOS and PCBs and, and what's coming and what does a lab need to prepare for. So having representatives from both ag agriculture and the Agency of Natural Resources on a governance board, you know, helping to What's next, if we can tell, I mean, things pop up, but a lot of interaction. Um, the lab was the last to be rebuilt after Tropical Storm Irene. It was washed out in Waterbury and the first floor was the Agency of Agriculture and the second floor was the Agency of Natural Resources in that old lab. So it was a legislative decision to combine the two and to mm -hmm. have this manner of governance so that it would be a, a strong interaction of what we're doing and where we're going. So we're, we're still working with um, the uh, Agency of Natural Resources. They do so many tests um, that getting the information out that, you know, the lab, the lab, uh, their lab can do testing and bringing some of those tests that have been sent out in house, et cetera. So still a work in progress, but a lot of interaction there and a very good, a very strong partnership and working hard together to make sure we do as many tests at this laboratory as possible um, and uh, you know sending it out of the you know using an outside lab the the uh, state lab has to be you know we can't undercut an outside lab so you know making sure we cover our costs but not you know making we're not we're not a for-profit lab so it's a it's a very good partnership and work hard together and uh, and really I think that's important to put out there that how much the interaction is going on. Yeah, thanks, Diane. Thanks. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Senator. Um, so, and then just to summarize, and uh, thank you again, Diane. I appreciate your the additional history there. Um, but just to summarize a few of the new areas that we're actively engaged in uh, right now, I think one was already mentioned with PCBs and air. Uh, so we are the state lab to do that testing. Uh, specifically to meet uh, the requirement that Vermont State Schools air quality is tested for the presence or absence of PCBs. And so we're actively involved working with, with ANR on that process. And then, as I know you've probably heard, PFAS is, is often in the news as a, a potential contaminant that can be in water, soil, and food. And so having the capacity at the state level to, again, test for that presence uh, at a very low level, we're talking parts per billion, um, is important. And so we've, uh, thanks to some investments that were made in the last legislative cycle, uh, we've invested in instrumentation and staffing that will enable us to uh, jumpstart that process and have that capacity uh, hopefully this year. So, so, so that, that hasn't started yet, Senator Coyne? Uh, so the great. PFAB uh, testing? So uh, thank you for the question, Senator. So. At this point, we have the instrument necessary, and we have a person uh, who will be joining our team at the end of January oh, uh, to lead our PFAS testing program. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, the PCBs uh, testing is, it's, I don't know if the standards have changed or what has happened, but we have town and community after community that is finding themselves in a position where they got to vacate a building or make plans to leave a like a schoolhouse in and, and that cost is uh, terrific uh, you know i i made the comment i don't know somewhere is that j peak ski area just sold uh and you know, there's three big hotels. There's a water park that cost millions, uh, an ice house uh, for skating, a golf course, uh, countless lifts and gondolas, and, and that sold for $77 million. And we hear, well, I think Fairfax was the latest one. Uh, they're voting on a $37 million renovation plan. Uh, Burlington High School 
they need a hundred and seventy or sixty seven million to replace their high school because of PCBs and um, so it's you know it's really costing a lot of money to correct problems that went on 20 years ago mm -hmm. yeah Irene Fairfax is in my district they just voted yesterday to pass the bond for that get, renovation and just to be clear it is not related to PCBs it's it strictly is, about it's, classroom uh, expansion okay they did test for PCBs the results came out just in the last couple of weeks and they aren't below Good. they're below the threshold so that's oh. one school district that's <laughs> yeah. not dealing with PCBs that's um, great. but yes they are spending a lot of money to renovate that school for other reasons mostly yeah. just well it's a popular growing. place yeah, they have Usually too much wrong. farmland up there that's getting converted. That's one of the, my issues. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> one of the reasons I want to be on this committee. Yeah, well, keep, keep the landscape working. Hopefully, we can keep what we have going. Yes, yes. Uh, but Burlington, indeed, yeah, that's all PCB related, and it's just yeah. mind boggling what costs. And we mandated the testing last year. So. Yes, yes, yes. And they're not the only ones. Thank you. So, anything else, Glenn? Uh, no, thank you for your time, Senators. Uh, appreciate yeah. it. Well, Again, if there's any follow-up questions, I appreciate you coming up and Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to go back um, to the cannabis issue, um, and I probably should have asked the question earlier. Who tests that? And from what I understood, if you're strictly raising or growing it for fiber, you now can uh, have to register with USDA. I think I heard that this morning. How about if someone's growing it for both, because there's a THC threshold. So who decides, kind of help me understand that whole scenario, if you would. Sure, thank you for the question. So I'm probably not the best person to answer it, but I'll attempt to answer it anyway. Well, I was just asking about the testing. Yes, yeah, so from the testing component, I think, so we have the um, Cannabis Control Board. Right and they're in their infancy so they're trying to establish what the testing protocol would look like so they have an array of tests from everything from heavy metals to the thc level the mold. potency yeah. to the yeah the bacteria mm -hmm. the molds and so they're developing what that process would look like and then our lab potentially may get involved uh, to serve some of those testing needs um, but it's a question of having the capacity to do that at this point. And so we don't test at the moment. We send it out, out of state. So at this point, we did do testing this past season, uh, but specifically with hemp. And this was strictly from a, sort of the trust and verify approach of we have a hemp sample. Is it truly hemp or has the THC level gone to a point that it's, it's cannabis? Um, so we did do that testing. Um, uh, within our organic section. Again, I think the challenge has been internally, while we'd love to grow our testing capacities to meet that need, but right now we've prioritized work with the PCB and air testing, the PFAS testing, uh, and, and in terms of the chemical need, these have all originated from our organic section. Um, so it's, a, it's really a, an active growth area in terms of the testing needs. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions for Glenn? Uh, so, thank you, Glenn. Yep, thank you and for your time. Thank you. If you need to leave. Much appreciated. Yeah, hopefully, um, maybe this year or next, we'll get down and visit the lab in the college and we'll stop in and see you. We'd love to see that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All. Yeah. So, Laura. It's almost your Saving turn. the best for last. <laughs> well, we got still got Diane. <laughs> I can't share for some reason. It says you, I just put you as co-host, so try again and see if that works. All right, well, let's move forward. And so I want to invite and welcome you to introduce Nina Gage here. Um, I, for the record, am Laura DiPietro. I'm the director of water quality, and I've been doing this for a while now, maybe a decade. Um, but Nina is new, so I'll let you just introduce yourself real quick. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Nice to meet you all. So, Same here. Uh, my name is Nina Gage. Um, I grew up in Rocky County, Brandon, Vermont. Oh. Um, 
my folks are still there. And I studied at University of Vermont in uh, Bachelor of Environmental Science, Environmental Studies from the Rudin Scene School of Environment and Natural Resources. A lot of my backdrop in school was around social science work. So um, I'm very interested in the behavioral aspects of our work in terms of changing the culture of what farms look like in Vermont. Uh, in, I've been working for the Water Quality Division for the past six years uh, behind the scenes. So I am both nervous and excited to be here with you today, but um, I look forward to assisting you with your needs throughout the session and in collaboration with, with Laura. So thank you for having us today and the opportunity to introduce a little bit about our programs. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. So I know we've gone through this a lot in other committees, but certainly um, give you a high level of sort of what we do, and then you know as the session goes on, or we expect we'll come in for specifics of what you need. But generally, um, what the Agency of Agriculture does in water quality, because that's what we're doing obviously in our division, is we deal with non-point source. And so there is, the way it's set up is DEC does the point source work. And they are required to have us do the non-point source work. And there's an MOU and we work together and collaborate in that space. And so um, we have the majority of inspectors, we have the grant programs, we have all of the work to do the water quality agricultural efforts. And when we find something that is so significant that it might be a point source, we have to send that over to DEC. And so we have a process with that. Um, and we can explain more over time as that comes up if there's questions. But that's generally what we do. So we do um, education and outreach. The bulk of that is put to our partners, so the clean water budget is the majority of our budget, and we take that money and then we move it to partners, so folks like UVM that you went to visit and conservation <coughs> districts, uh, they take those funds and they run programs. So for instance, like the UVM will, we've outsourced the um, custom manure applicator, so every farmer who hires a custom manure applicator can ensure that that applicator has been trained and understands the regulations so that when they're applying manure on their farm, they should be doing it by the rules. Uh, and farmers also have to get education as well. There's a requirement for that. So they run those programs to have these opportunities so that people can access them. But of course, we do our own education and outreach as we need to about our programs and practices. <clears throat> we inspect and enforce on farms, and this is the majority of work that we do. We actually we have two office locations, and I know a lot of folks are remote, um, but we do have our Williston office is um, near the is it Restore? I can't remember mm -hmm. anymore. It used to be Goodwill. Um, but it's right behind there, and um, it's actually the USDA office there. So there's a nice collaboration with the Farm Service Agency and, and the Natural Resource Conservation Service. But that is where our staff are located that do all of this regulatory work, and also our engineering technical work is there in that office. And then in Montpelier are the folks that basically move the money, right? Yeah. Um, so we go and visit farms. So we broke farms down into categories. And you know the large farms have, for us, they have an individual permit. So we have a little more scrutiny on them. And we visit them a lot more often. So we visit them every year. And this is all in statute that we have to do this. Mm -hmm. The medium farms, um, we visit them every three years. And then the certified, I'm sorry, the yeah, certified small farms, that's a relatively new category. It came out of the act. Um, yeah. Uh, 64 of 2015, which is basically anybody with 50 or more cows, if you think about it in the dairy world. Uh, so we inspect them every seven years. But of course, any one of these farms, the moment we step on their farm, and if they have any issues, we don't disappear for one year or three years or seven years. Um, they become part of our regular cycle until it gets resolved, and then they go back into that cycle um, as necessary. <laughs> so we do a lot more visits, and we'll show you some data um, about all of this, but that, that's predominantly what we do. Is that my neighbor up there? It might be, yeah. <laughs> right down the road in the south. Yeah, uh, yeah so we, we inspect production areas, we inspect the fields, we walk around every single thing in the production area, like a silage bunk or a manure storage. Um, we walk every ditch as far as we can walk. Um, so we spend a lot of time getting a lot of miles. It is the one service we offer is we allow people a, a budget to buy boots because we know that there is nothing more valuable than a good one pair of boots when you have to spend your entire day outside walking for very many miles. Uh, so, and then these te technical financial assistance programs, the kind of things that they do, these are just photographic examples, which, oh good, you don't see what I see. Um, 
you see on the left, that's a cover crop. And so we have a lot of money that comes into the agency and farmers do a lot too. We'll show you the data about that um, to help plant that. And then, you know, in the two middle pictures here, grazing is another area that, you know, has increasingly been, it's always been something Vermont has done, right? But as far as the cost share programs, we've been trying more and more to develop a space there. And I will tell you admittedly, the agency of ag doesn't have a staff position who is a grazing specialist, right? UVM extension generally does that work. We help them, for instance, have a position so that they can go and do this work. Um, so we move the money to make sure that people have, you know, if they need watering tubs or fencing, laneways, et cetera. Um, but that is one space where there is a gap out there in terms of the, the capacity to service. So that's the organic, a lot of organic. Not necessarily really just, it's more than organic. I mean, all heifers are generally on, on pasture if they can be on a farm, right, um, at some level. So it, there's a lot of farms still have absolutely a component of pasture. Have you, have you done any testing on fields that, where the animals are out loose, you know, out? Um, pasture and, um, and and farms that confine their animals. Do the soil tests run any different? Uh, you know, the cows are out there punching little bits wet, they're making little marks in the soil to retain water, and they're pooping and and you know that is is there any difference in what happens to soil? Yeah, between... I'm not gonna be able to answer your question holistically because it depends on every farm. But if you were to grab a research paper that described what each farm was like, then I think you could respond to that. And you know, Heather Darby is definitely a great one to ask. She has been taking a lot more soil health tests. So we don't take soil health tests as a regulatory requirement, right? So we don't do any soil testing. We require it by the farms, but they're only required to get nutrient analysis. So they're not required to get soil health or water and capacity, organic matter. We're going to have to maybe start doing more soil testing if we're going to, uh, you know, uh, produce uh, papers uh, supporting what Ryan is mm -hmm. doing. And that yeah. effort is doing that. Um, and so again, there's there's a number of tests that have been done in the state and generally what they found is you know Vermont actually does really well because we are a manure based state right Midwest they're not manure based agriculture and in Vermont we are which as a resource into the soil it actually creates good organic matter and water retention so yeah. um, but defining whether pasture or or you know just regular hayland or cropland would be differentiating I think it depends on the management of the pasture right stocking density and all those other things so it all depends so yeah <laughs> I don't know, of course, I live on the farm I grew up on. And remembering, you know, when we used to do the hay, and then you would pasture, or you would let the field uh, fields grow up, and the cows would, and they would, you know, make little uh, holes in our earth with their feet, hoofs. And then you would have rain, and you know they would poop in them fields, and the rainwater and everything else would run down through and get when those hook prints. And it just seemed like uh, the hay and the next year would be good, but now if you don't fertilize those fields because the cows are gone and there's no cows in there punching little holes in the soil to let the water in with, you know, you still get some, but uh, it's, it's different. And I don't know, that's just, you know, visually seeing things and wondering about things. Yeah. So. Um, again, UVM might be able to answer your question a little better than I can because they look at that type of data and information and have analyzed yeah. it pretty extensively. Maybe conservation mm -hmm. districts, that, do they do anything like that? They're usually partnered with UVM, so I think UVM would be a good source to go to. Yeah. Um, and then the picture on the right is um, our capital equipment assistance program. So we have been given money, we do a little around a million dollars, um, plus or minus a year, to help farmers buy equipment that does a next level innovation into the farm field. So that's right. injection, right? That's an example, yeah. See um, and that that leads back to the hook 
marks in the, you know, in the soil. No, you're right. You're right. That rate goes down through and makes little yep. little scratches in the soil. So this specific equipment is called a grassland shallow slot manure injector. It's produced by, um, it's actually out of the Netherlands where this technology has come from. Um, it injects manure shallowly below the soil surface. It's specifically designed for hay and forage-based uh, yeah. fields. Typically, if you're injecting on a, on a hay or grass field, you're gonna see pretty substantial impact to your hay crop. Um, so hence, a lot of farmers for a long time were, were really resistant to it. Um, this technology has created a pathway for manure injection on hay fields where we, you know, in Vermont, a very large majority of our agricultural fields are in perennial systems in grass or hay. So it's provided a new opportunity. We've developed a few of these systems across the state um, to support farms, both through like uh, individual farmer agreements, as well as uh, cooperative and, and sort of extension or conservation district supported shared equipment. Has, has that been running long enough to uh, determine if you get a better crop off a field that uh, this injector system has gone through than, say, a mechanical, regular mechanical manure spreader has gone through? Um, I don't know the details of the comparison studies, but I know that we supported UVM Extension a couple of years ago to look at some of the impact. Uh, unfortunately, the years of study were impacted during a drought year, so some of the initial results were mm -hmm. um, you know, not ideal just considering the, the drought conditions of the season. Um, and that was work that Kirsten Workman had taken on. She's recently left her position at UVM. So I have to check in with them on, on where things landed in terms of research. But um, it's still pretty new. It's, it's a new technology. Yeah. Um, but folks are excited about it. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, and then we also have our biggest program as far as the amount of budget dedicated towards it is what we call our BMP, Best Management Practice. And so these are just before and after examples. This is the capital infrastructure going in on farms in production areas, so concrete and whatnot. But you know, we don't buy barns as an example, but we may help create a barnyard to control runoff and then have that directed into a manure storage so that way then it can be appropriately land applied through a nutrient management plan. Um, or in the lower one, you know, help a laneway <clears throat> where animals, because they're going in and out for milking every day, multiple times a day that impact can really build up and so trying to help make it reinforce so they can come through and scrape it and manage the material and we have engineers that help design that work we also work with nrcs which is the federal partner and we have shared engineers as well so we will um, work to create or you know use each of our budgets to be able to make sure we get this work done so is those are gravel packs or those lane that's concrete. They're concrete right? in this in this particular. That's area. like for a barn yard or a feeding area. Well, and this is a clearly near the barn, much more heavier used area. Um, they're probably going to stand there and aggregate before they go in to milking. Okay. Um, but you're correct. If we were out, you know, moving them out to pasture, for instance, it would likely be more of a gravel base. We wouldn't. We don't put <laughs> concrete highways for animals no. to get out of pasture. <laughs> <laughs> and everything we do is you know least cost um, best practice. So. Yeah, that's kind of muddy, a muddy place yeah. there that before you concrete it. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And get us a great drainage and get the, you know, so the roof water doesn't any longer come through there. It can be drained outside of it so it doesn't get wasted into yeah. it and make more volume of waste. We want to try and reduce the volume of waste that we have to manage. Um, so this part, I'm really, really excited because I think Nina has done an amazing amount of work over the last couple of years. You know, we've come to you and we've reported things over time, right? And there's always those questions of what are you doing with our resources and how are farmers doing in terms of implementing things? And, you know, we can give you paper reports, but they're just not as fun, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> and so this is an interactive space where this is, this is the first time it's being shown to anyone. So you are getting, yeah, you are, you are the first opportunity to see this. And so we've been able to take all this data um, with new staff and resources that we've had over these last couple of years. We've been hiring some really intelligent folks, which has been great because they've got all these skills and capabilities to retool how we manage our data and put it into this uh, website that you can interact. So we were able to go back in time too and look at a little bit of data. We haven't gone all the way back in time, um, but at least since you know mostly Act 64 and looking at what has happened since then. Um, the other thing is, as far as you know, trying to share this data, we share a lot of this data with DEC. 
So that was also part of why we had to put a lot of this data together and then we realized we could build this additional tool. Um, so one of the things Nina does with her whole team is make sure that we get all of our data gathered each year, do the quality assurance on it, and then send it over to DEC. And then DEC has separate reporting mechanisms to do the whole clean water effort, right? So what we're showing you today is just ag, and um, it's put into the way of looking at it that for us makes the most sense. So I will go ahead and let you drive for a little bit. You take control of it. I wonder if it'll, I wonder if we're, since we're presenting. No, don't fail us now. I just have to, yeah, yeah I have to pull it up for switch. So as Laura mentioned, we, um, we have invested a pretty considerable amount of time and energy to build uh, what I like to think of as our foundational uh, measurements and metrics. Um, some of these are developed in collaboration with the Department of Environmental Conservation uh, through their Clean Water Initiative program because they're used across sectors. And some um, are crucial for us in terms of uh, strategizing better ways to approach a region of the state or a specific practice that you know we're not seeing the level of implementation that we'd like to see. Um, at the same time, I truly believe that data um, should drive our decision making. So we're really excited to, this, to show you a little bit about this. Again, it's a sneak peek preview. Our official report will be published um, on the website for Sunday. That's our annual report on technical and financial assistance in our programs. Um, we are apologize in advance for the acronyms, but just let you know that the uh, initial page of this has a reference point for our assistance programs as well as key terms that might be utilized throughout this report if you get confused um, between programs. If you select um, the center of the screen, it provides a table of contents. Um, we have about, I think, 12 or 13 individual pages. Uh, the second page is instructions. So this is a great quick reference if you're unsure of how to click through. Uh, but basically the idea is to provide uh, the people with access to the data in terms of um, understanding the trends that we see across the state. Um, so Scott, you go back, way back to 16 then. So in some cases we have data in place since Act 64 came about Act uh, 2015. Um, that was sort of the impetus to begin some of these tracking systems. Mm -hmm. um, the first pages are both tactical basin maps and uh, county based maps. It gives you the ability to filter through uh, to look at investments. Um, when you see a filter adjacent to a figure, it means that that figure is based on data uh, in that instance. So in this case, I'll filter for 2022 and you can just see uh, the rate of both investment, acreage or conservation practices, and associated phosphorus reductions from those conservation practices. Um, just as a general point of information. Um, the state at this point in time can estimate phosphorus reductions in the Lake Champlain and Lake Memphis Mangog watersheds only. Is that uh, 22,857? Oh, kilograms. Kilograms of okay. phosphorus uh, reduced as a result of agricultural conservation practices on the landscape. Um, uh, also on Sunday is the Clean Water Investment report will be due and you'll be able to see the comparison of how agriculture is performing in terms of the other sectors but in the past few years agriculture's come in around 95 percent of the total estimated phosphorus reductions occurring in the state of vermont you mean we're doing pretty well. whatever is being done we're doing there you go. agriculture is an incredibly <clears throat> cost effective mechanism of reducing phosphorus runoff so those colors on your maps um like up up near looks like Swanton, uh, Franklin County. Uh, is that um, a heavy phosphorus area that that where maybe more has been extracted or? Thank you, Senator, for your question. It's a great question. In general, the maps in this report are going to, you're going to see a higher concentration at a darker color. So typically, you know, we have a lot of reductions that need to happen in both of the Siskoi, South Lake, and Otter Creek basins. So, so you're going to see a pretty significant is, investment and, um, you know, general work in those areas. Yep. Uh, I'm going to breeze through this as best I can and just let you know that the, the goal is that this will be at your fingertips if you need to look at information in the future. Um, in general, since fiscal 16, our, our division has supported about $41 million in investment. Um, 
in fiscal 22, uh, we had uh, about 12.2 million in investment. Um, one of the points I'll just you know bring up at, in since fiscal 16, when this data tracking system was put in place, um, about 40% of our total project costs has been in the form of match. So our programs play a pretty crucial role in leveraging federal funding. Um, to the state of Vermont for projects to happen. And what that means is a farmer may not have the, the funding to support the whole project. So the NRCS, um, Natural Resource Conservation Service of USDA, Environmental Quality Incentives Program, uh, will provide sort of the majority of the funding for a project and the state will come in and assist so that we can get that project in the ground. Otherwise, the farmers are sort of faced to you know walk away from the project because they can't move forward cost-wise. Uh, so yeah, we play a very, a very crucial role in terms of bringing additional uh, projects to Vermont, additional federal funding. Um, in terms of actual conservation practices being implemented on the ground, um, cover crop is one of our largest sort of conservation practices that we're supporting and, and assisting farmers to adopt, both increase their adoption rate of and improve their, their implementation of. Um, you'll see sort of a little bit of a dip in fiscal 22 practices and associated cost reductions. Um, and, and that part of that is just, you have to understand that at the end of the fiscal year on June 30th, we still have a variety of active projects happening and reporting processes happening. So next year, you'll see that number increase slightly when we're able to capture the data, do the geospatial mapping associated with all these programs, and then um, QEQC see the data before it's brought into our reporting processes. So what are the, all of the colors are <clears throat> They're over on the side, so we can track what, what the different colors mean. Thank you, Senator. Great question. Uh, if you hover over any aspect of this interactive data report, it will provide you with both the sort of topic area and um, an associated <coughs> metric with it. So in this case, we have over 85,000 acres of cover crop supported through our programs. Um, it's about 40% um, of all practice acreage that we have been supporting through state-funded programs. Yep. Um, another important caveat to uh, acreage and cluster reductions is that we are looking in this graphic at state-supported efforts. The federal government, the United States Department of Agriculture, Environmental Quality Incentives Program, um, and generally programs under the Natural Resource Conservation Service, they contribute significantly to conservation in Vermont. And those metrics are not incorporated into this report. This is Just solely state-funded aspects. Um, so Laura mentioned in the beginning that um, you know our education outreach to the agricultural community is a key piece of our work. Um, sometimes that's in the form of an event, right? It's a, a workshop at a local farm that can invite neighbors to come and, and see a best management practice like an impact manure system and how that works so that they can you know, have the opportunity to ask questions and potentially implement a similar practice on their own farms. Um, and sometimes an event might be a stakeholder meeting um, to pull people together and, and get input on um, a new program. We also support uh, visits to farms. Again, as m folks may know, a lot of farms tend to live in rural areas. They may not be as connected to things that are happening. Um, so our ability to be on farms is really crucial to connect farmers with, with state and federal programs and resources and or knowledge about regulations that may be applying to them. <clears throat> this includes both um, technical visits provided by UVM Extension under our funding programs as well as our, our staff on farms. Uh, I'll have Laura speak a little bit about this, but um, we also have some data on production areas inspected for farms. And one thing I'll say, so the partnership and the way that we get this data, at some level to their, their frustration, I'm sure, um, but in order to give the money to people, we ask them to report this stuff back to us, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a requirement in the granting, and we've set up these ways that they can electronically get this information to us so that we can get it into this method. Um, but I think they're all, you know, in the first couple of years, it was probably tougher to adapt and, and change. Um, the other thing we have that helps get some of the data out is we have, um, we talked about it years ago, and it's just, it's continued to flourish, which is great. We have the only, I'm pretty sure we're the only state in the United States of America that has a partnership database where multiple agricultural entities all work within that database. And we started building it with the USDA. Unfortunately, USDA has privacy and challenges, right? So they were hopeful at the time when Vicki Drew was the state conservationist that they could make it work, but 
lawyers had other thoughts about it. Um, so they can't participate. They can look at it, but they can't put their data in it. But still the same, um, Conservation Districts, UVM, anyone we give a, a grant that's in this <coughs> MOU between all the partnership to say you will respect how this data is managed and you will put it in. Um, and we also have created barriers where like folks like myself, because I'm a regulator, right? Like I look at everything and I'm thinking regulation. I can't access it, right? I can look at it and get aggregate data, but I can't. So what's going on on Senator Campion's farm? You know, like I can't do that. You can't? Um, or you mean it won't show you? Or? I don't have login access. There's actual controls in the data so that my access cannot get me there, right? Well, um, you so could we, tell me, may I ask a question? You could tell me how many farms I, were I, fined I, yeah. last year. Well, it doesn't have that kind of data in it. Okay. It's all partner type data, you know, visits and, and work that they did with them. So it's a way and a mechanism to be able to say, if, if you imagine a bunch of non-regulatory folks working with farms out there, mm -hmm. UVM, conservation mm -hmm. districts, they could look up a farm and say, well, who was there last? What were they working with them on? Who should I, oh, I see this problem here. It looks like this other person's already been working with them on that. I'm gonna give them a call because I think they need help just like getting that next piece of paper and process and getting into the program, et cetera. So it's a way to just connect people to help make sure everything just keeps moving in the right direction. Um, so it's really for like work on the ground and conservation planning. Um, we have a separate database, which we are in the process of building, which is where I can answer all those questions that you have about how many enforcement actions and who and whatever. And that data is, you know, it could be very specific. You could ask about a specific farm. Um, we do have a policy internally where we said, not until the farmer gets the enforcement action do we like to share that because we'd like them to know first. Um, but once it's been mailed and received, we use that you know, green card um, certified mail, then it's a public record that we're happy to share. So I just want to understand the process because I think this is pretty innovative. Mm -hmm. um, it's only the non-regulatory entities that have the login. Is that what you're saying? We have different access logins. So uh -huh. like I have a, uh, well, I'll just call it a regulator login, right? Yeah. And, and other folks like UVM Extension have a full access login. Okay. So. But the farmer, I don't want to speak for the farmer because I don't know. I assume if I were a farmer, I might feel a little better about knowing that yep. you can't see some stuff. That's the plan. It's like it's okay. about building comfort. And again, we really did intentionally build it to get USDA in there because we knew USDA, we are not allowed to share that data, period, if we ever get it, right? And so. We knew there were federal requirements, and so we built it for that. And there's still hope. Maybe they can come in, right? Maybe some new lawyer will have a different vision. But um, that that is the focus as well: is that people can talk to farmers and say, "It's okay. Like, I see you have a problem. I'm glad you called me. We can help you, and we can get you to, to get a solution in place." I, th I would think it would tend to make it more yeah. legitimate and accurate too. And we can have data now to right. talk about what's going on out there. Yeah. How many people are accessing them? What type of programs do they need? That kind of thing. See, it, we've had reports in the past that a lot of farmers will call the conservation districts right. to go in and try to oversee the whole operation to see where they're in compliance, not in, they try to get fixed up before war gets there. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so that they don't get into trouble. But you can go, <clears throat> You can have an inspector go and not necessarily the farmer be in trouble, right? Well, if there's something wrong. A certain, <laughs> well, aren't they given a certain length of time to try to get things back up to order so that uh, when you go back in 60 days or 90 days or whatever it is, that they are in compliance? So there's different levels of enforcement. Um, we generally, in statute, it says if agency of ag finds somebody has a problem, we have to tell them what their problem is. Yeah. So the first method, most typically, is a corrective action letter, which you get 30 days to respond back to us and say what you're going to do. And it's basically we approve, you know, sometimes there's an interim plan, sometimes there's a long-term plan. But we say, yep, that might work. Or we say, nope, try again, send us another letter, please. Um, yeah. But that process is meant to, A, there's no penalties associated with it and it's meant to create a compliance schedule and get the process yeah. done. So um, it is a lighter weight level of enforcement, so it starts there. But then if they don't do whatever they said or they don't respond or whatever, then it can move up. And the next step is typically a penalty from there. Yeah. So um, 
this page is our enforcement page and it sort of gives you an understanding. It, we didn't break it out by the type of enforcement action. Um, majority of our actions are corrective action letters, um, but notices of violations are more and more common and um, admittedly they're probably more and more common on the medium and the larger farms because we've already been regulating them for so much longer doing inspections that if you've been noticed about something once, we have seven years that if you have to have that problem come up again, that means you'll probably go to notice a violation. So there's sort of a, a seven year limitation on coming back into um, understanding. Um, so you can see, you know, our enforcement actions have absolutely gone over, up over time. Um, I think a great part of that is the capacity, right? We, when we first started doing water work, we didn't have resources. And, you know, really Act 64 of 2015 gave us some capacity to be able to do this work. And so you can see after 2016, the workload has significantly been able to um, not only do more inspections, but you know, it's just this idea of like, if there's more cops on the road, you tend, well, sometimes I guess it tends to everybody slows down, but um, you end up potentially getting caught, more like so, getting caught. So, uh, like where the, your graph goes up um, to 80, 80, what, two. seven, eighty-two, yeah. uh, one hundred and one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, those are enforcement actions, actions which is encompassing and of all the types of actions. If you if you went back and I bet if you went back and checked, you no, know, see most of that's on dairy farms, I presume. And if you went back and checked milk you know, prices. That's when they were probably getting uh, 15, 16 dollars a hundred weight, and they had no money. I, I mean, I don't know if that's mm -hmm. true, but it would bear looking at because those years in there, you know, we had like five really bad years, and uh, I bet, I bet. Yep. Well, some of the, in uh, these years, we had about four inspectors, right? In these years, we have about 11. Uh, so we doubled capacity. Oh, so you had a lot more inspectors. We have a lot too. more inspectors. So yeah. they could drill down. We could, we could visit a lot more farms. And what we also started doing in this space, so in this group, you know, in the prior years, if I were to jump up to the graph up here, this bar chart. Yep. Sorry, I'm on the wrong page. Let me, um, let me take you to production areas inspected. <clears throat> um, this data doesn't go back because we just, this is coming from our new database that really we just haven't had oh, the capacity 19. to go back in time and key in all the old data. Um, so this will be a going forward and as we can get to it, we'll get information going backwards. But um, what we used to do based on having four people, right, and trying to regulate all these farms was we couldn't get to every facility each year. So an individual permitted farm, for instance, like a large farm might have nine facilities that they have animals at or manure storage at. Um, once we got the capacity and staff, we changed all the protocols and said, go everywhere and do everything, right? And so that's one thing where if you look at this top chart here, the orange as an example is large farms. So our acronyms are certified small farm, large farm, medium farm, non-RAP or farms that are lower than what the RAPs regulate, and then small farms are very small farms that are regulated by us, but don't have to certify with us. No, under 50. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, but you see how big of an area we have in terms of the amount. So this is like, when we look at a production area, um, again, it's the, it's the infrastructure, typically, is what this is looking at. So there's more infrastructure sites that we're going to on large farms versus these other size farms. So, you know, yeah. while there may only be, and I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, I want to say like 39 large farms, like there's well over, I mean, there's 200, well, I guess we'll just give you the total. Well, that, that year we inspected 113 facilities, right? So. Between medium and large. No, just large, just large. So, um, so while we may not have that many, it appears certified, or I'm sorry, on permitted farms, they are actually multiple farms associated with individual permits. Um, and you can see this is the actual acreage, so a production area and the size of it, right? So as the farm is bigger in size, typically the production area is also, you know, square footage yeah, acreage bigger. And so you can see large farms. Of the inspections we do, the, the majority of the area that we walk and look at is the area of a large farm. 
Uh, so um, I can't remember why I was taking you there. But <laughs> what, uh, the little, the one on top is the small farms. The blue. The littlest is the, yeah, the, the blue. Those are the <clears throat> small farms. Yeah. Yeah, so basically. They don't have much acreage either. No, no, and yeah, you want to show the compliance one? Yeah. Um, so what we also track is just how, how compliant are these things, right? So one of the things we have to do for TMDL tracking is try and figure out how to quantify. We do all these inspections, what are we finding, right? And so um, if you look at this, this bottom chart here, percent compliance by fiscal year reported. So this is each year, this is the blue is um, compliant and the orange is not compliant. And you know it's slight, uh, admittedly, but there is an increase in compliance going on, um, which is good. Um, in the if you this is breaks it down up here by farm size. You know certified small farms are the most compliant. Um, but one thing to be noted about this is the caveat data again. Like if they're compliant when we visit them, we may not be back there for seven years. So in the interim, we may not know if they've changed things if they're no longer compliant. Um, to where like the large farms, again, we're there every year. Yeah. So this is, you know, this is a lot more intense data to say that 69% are compliant. So while the data shows that certified small farms appear to be more compliant, um, the data behind it isn't as rigorous likely as the large but, farms because of the volume of inspections yeah. they do. Uh, thanks, Chair. So I just want to, so it's 30% roughly since, and I may be misreading this, since 2019 to 2022 of farms that aren't compliant. Yep, when we go there, they're, they're not compliant. So I imagine these are, re, are these repeat offenders, sort of, you know, what, what are you seeing there? Or is it, gosh, you're, you're not compliant and you're just popping up. Tell me a little bit more about the data. I don't know if I could like pare down the yeah. data specifically, but I'll just tell you our process, right? Yeah. So this is a sense of, we inspected X number of farms. Yeah. Of those, how many did we have like a clean bill of health? Yeah. That's the blue box. That's the blue box. So yeah. the ones that we didn't have a clean bill of health, those are the ones where we assess it and you know, majority of the time it gets referred to enforcement and is dealt with enforcement. Every once in a while we will do a programmatic follow-up and say, well, you know, you were you were you were missing a soil test, uh -huh. right? Like yes, you fall in that category, but the reality is is one little thing. You know, it's just like a small thing. Like uh -huh. we, we may not enforce on you long. We might just what we we call them is programmatic follow ups, and so we schedule those okay. and track those and make sure that someone follows up and that they are compliant. And if they're not at that point, then they would get referred over to enforcement. Enforcement. So um, the, the the important thing to look at there, though, I think, is that you got seventy percent of the large farms, that's large farms you're showing, that are in compliance mm -hmm. and 30% are, are so-so. But if you look at the acreage in the number of animals, if you back up to the slide before, that's where the majority of the land is mm -hmm. and the cows are. Mm -hmm. And so if you took a percentage of of the total acreage and the percentage of the total animals, those numbers might be a lot, lot higher that are in compliance. Yeah, and I mean you can look to see the the little see the the where the numbers are. You can you can see the enforcement actions by year uh -huh. too. You know the majority of actions. You know or on, on medium farms, actually, interestingly enough, um, because those farms, in my yeah. this is just a personal opinion based on yeah. what I've seen, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the large farms have figured out how to use the programs, invested in things. Um, they are buying more smaller farms, and so they are they get those farms pretty quickly up to speed. Like, they, they know the system, they know the drill with us, and they, they are you know generally responsive. The medium farms, um, they sort of have been in this category where I think if you look at the financials, they're more stressed than any other group. And so the was ability... Did you just say medium? Yeah. Yeah. Medium. yeah. yeah um, they're caught in the middle. It's, it's either, you, you know, you get bigger, you, you go out. And yeah. so, and if you look at some of the data, that's the group that we've lost the most of, is the medium farms. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so, you know, the compliance on those is a little more challenged, is a little more nuanced in terms of trying to get to that end goal. Um, and oftentimes, a lot of the actions that we end up taking, they are associated with them not paying the um, annual certification fee, right? So, if you, like in some years, you know, we'll have 30, 40 of them that didn't pay. And so, it's like those go, we send notices, but like, so that kind of stuff falls into this data as well. So, it may not always be about a water quality issue as much as, you know, essentially they owe us money um, for an annual fee. So we could tease that stuff out more, but um, that I think is why the medium farm category comes up more into these spaces. I know yeah, I mean, it'd be helpful to tease yeah. it out at some point, and maybe the report itself, you know, if somebody said to me a third of our hospitals weren't compliant, you know, we'd all be panicked, we'd all say, hey, you know, let's get, let's fix this situation. A third of our school, you know, so it would be helpful to better maybe understand what's happening there. Sorry, we just lost yeah. internet. Oh, okay. Completely lost internet. Mm -hmm. But anyways, we, we don't have to go through it more um, in terms yeah. of that, but... Yeah, we, we still know. got to get EB and yeah. Diane on for a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Just so they can come back another day. We lost internet in here one yeah. day last week also. I don't know if... So I'll just say a couple more things, if you don't mind, if I can do it without internet. Um, so I just want to show you that. So thank you for taking time and checking it out. And you can poke around more now. Very excited stuff. that you're excited about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but the sort of hot spots or areas that have been kind of going on since the last time we were here at this building. Um, waste importation on farms has been a really big discussion in our space, right? Because there's the universal recycling law, so no more food scraps can go to the landfill. Um, but there's still this challenge of you know what is a clean food scrap what is a good thing to bring on to a farm and so what we have right now currently is the authority to regulate based on nutrients not based on trash right and so we've been trying to have conversations and try and learn or about PFAS right imports um, yeah. what we want to make sure and what we you know we don't have the space to, to do this outwardly um, but is that we keep our farmland clean and that where we grow our food is healthy and safe. Um, so that's a space where we've been working a lot with DEC and trying to navigate and understand it, but it's certainly a very much increasing pressure yeah. on farms because there's no place to take this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and farms, you know, it can be recycled. There's absolutely clean ways that can be recycled and put onto farms, but um, there has been a DPAC committee that got set up last year, which you may remember from right. bills that passed, yeah. that there, and you know, that is a big part of the conversation certainly is there's a lot of plastic that goes into that initial stuff that's not so separated. I mean, our big issue is cleaning it, right? Well, they, they essentially auger and grind it and then try and separate the flows, um, but there is still a plastic contamination rate. And as we know, unfortunately, a lot of our food does already have PFAS in it from some of the packaging that is put into it. I know there's a, you know efforts to try and reduce that, but um, tough. it's tough. And so we're just trying to make sure that farms don't become the you know recipient of our society's waste, such that then some future we don't have good space to grow food. Are um, there other states that have dealt with this uh, ahead of us? So that they're the way. How are they handling it? Or mm -hmm. better management of it? Or are there? Yeah, there's, there's definitely. I mean, this is a topic, and more and more you're seeing it in headlines. Um, I just actually went to visit Maine and talk with their mm -hmm. agency of agriculture over there. Um, they have gotten ahead of us on PFOPs and managing it in that space. Um, but as far as depackaging, they, they're not aware of it, right? Um, but Massachusetts has a lot more depackaging, and New York does as well. Um, and they've raised concerns, but they haven't necessarily figured out, again, a solution. California as well, um, of how to deal with it, because we make a lot of waste. We're really good at that as humans, um, and trying to process it and manage it and to reduce the you know, landfill impact. It's an all it's all balance, and so there is no silver bullet at this point that anyone has identified. That Will landfills of. take that white plastic? I mean, can you take it to the landfill? Well, so like if you have food in a package that um, you had a huge batch, right? Like a truckload of a batch of bad something. It didn't fill all the way, mm -hmm. or it, it's a little off spec, or you know, you've got the wrong ice cream in the wrong container, right? <laughs> like whatever, yeah. Yeah. whatever happened. Um, instead of manually opening and separating all that food from the container packaging, this is the technology that is available and has been used is just to sort of smash it, right? And hope that the, you know, whatever the product well, was we in it will go out. that last year. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Chittenden County, they've got a yes. deep pack. Yes, there's one in Vermont. 
And so that stimulated a lot of the conversation of just, and UVM's doing research on how much plastic gets into that, um, just to try and understand what this is, because it's tough, isn't it? It is. So that's one, again, it's a pressure that's been coming to us. Um, we've been trying to keep a focus on narrowing it to a few farms versus having it be a lot of farms. But again, we don't have the authority to regulate plastics or PFAS or contaminants like that. We have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and how much storage volume of well, a farm has. I think, you know, instead of working like some other committees work uh, in this building, I would want to have an alternative in place to require, you know, farmers to switch to before, um, you know, just saying, okay, as of 2025, there's no more white plastic snowballs going to be seen in Vermont. We better have an alternative figured out for what they can use in the place of of uh, the plastic uh, because we know that it's going to lay in the, wherever they dump it in the landfills or wherever it's going to be there for ever yeah. well it'll take a lot of years time. for it to whatever happens to it yeah. and, and Canada's doing some research too because I mean some of this can get the plastics can actually go into the plants um, as well yeah. if, they're, if they're micro enough um, so we're going to learn as much as we can, but it just that's a space that it's been quite a year <laughs> learning lots about that. Yeah. And the other thing is um, farm determinations and what is a farm. We never actually even had a process to do this. Hmm. Um, you know, it was just you were farming. Everybody was farming. Oh, yeah, I'm um, a farmer. And now you've right. got you've got you know Act Two Fifty asks lots of questions. He's a farmer. Yeah. I've got twenty five chickens in my farm. All right. Yeah, well, I mean, it depends. To your right. point, what has started to happen is so we said that, uh, and all, all due respect, I mean this in the nicest way, but like backyard. Yeah. No. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, was no longer in the RAPs, right? Yeah. Because municipalities can't regulate farming as it is defined in the RAPs. And the RAPs, we said, you know what? But backyard farms have taken a lot of our energy, and we know we have to do this big water stuff. So we carved that out. But what's starting to happen is municipalities are making regulations to tell people they can't have chickens. And so everybody's coming to us saying, help me. How do I figure out how to keep my chickens? I love them. Um, and so there's this interesting balance going on in that space. But between towns trying to figure out what to do with it, Act 250, Section 248, stormwater utilities are charging farms. Interesting. Um, you know, some of this, like the universal recycling law, like how much imports are you taking? If you take too many imports, you're no longer a farm. And so we're just constantly getting bombarded at this point with, am I farming? I need to know this so that I can deal with X, Y, or Z. Um, accessory on farm business. And so it's been just constant. And it was something we never envisioned was going to be as rampant as it is, but it's consumed an enormous amount of our capacity um, in the last year. So, and then there's just one more thing. Just to end on a more positive note, <laughs> um, in 2020, our team um, received a $7 million award from USDA to offer a new program called Vermont Paper Performance Program. Yeah. This is an innovative program that uses environmental modeling to look at field by field phosphorus losses on farms. Um, and provide performance-based payments for Mount Farms. So we are one year into that program. Um, over the course of four years, about $5 million of additional federal funding um, will, will be available for Vermont Farms that meet certain stewardship thresholds uh, above and beyond what's required for, for regulatory purposes. Um, but we're very excited about that program. It is the first time farms have the ability to see on their own operation their field-by-field -field losses, as well as to, to compare that to state water quality goals. Uh, so a new tool in our conservation toolbox. So like Ryan mentioned so this So you morning. work with Ryan on that? Well, he's doing whole ecosystem services, right? Yeah. This is literally looking at how much phosphorus did you reduce on oh. your farm? So it's an alternative to pay for the pounds of production of phosphorus. Now, uh, do you check what a farmer buys for fertilizer because I've heard a lot of farmers buy very little phosphorus anymore. Yes. You know, they have their soil tests to go by, so they they go by that, and that's what they try to buy. Is that accurate? Or? Thank you for the prompt. Um, the really awesome part about this program is that we are utilizing uh, place-based geospatial information, so it's looking at specific soil type. 
um, your entry data, such as your soil test for that field, which gets updated regularly. You're looking at the manure test values, manure application rates on each individual field, as well as um, you know what crop and potential crop yield and, and nutrient uptake you're having from that. So it's on a field by field basis, looking at all the data that um, farms do right through their land management, comparing that to the actual soil type, the actual location of that field, and providing the farmer with a sense of where they can target their conservation efforts to have the most impact. So where can they spend more money in conservation on a field to have the best impact in terms of producing phosphorus runoff? So if they're still using a little bit of fertilizer and it identifies they don't need it and then they can reduce it and get a payment for it, this will show it to them. I was over at Red Shepherd's, um, I don't know, this summer, sometime, and uh, he showed me the letter from his agronomist and a lot of his field, he does manure injection and, yeah. and broad uh, spraying. And uh, some of his fields that he was at, well, most, a lot of them, he could cut his fertilizer, commercial fertilizer, in half. Buying it could cut it in half because he because has he's the doing risk. these yeah. 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 Probably a lot of the practices. Yeah. Not and, and, you know, he, he's just one of many big farms that, or farmers that afford to, can afford to do that kind of stuff. As a farmer mentioned to me last week at a meeting, uh, we've been studying and looking at data from cows for, you know, a decade, two decades, and now we're really in the space where we can look at that level of information about individual fields and, and areas within fields that are causing the concern or, or contributing in a beneficial way to See, the other thing we, a lot of the phosphorus comes in through feeds, I've understood, commercial feed. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, it goes through the animal, the feed does, and what comes out the other end has got a lot of phosphorus in it. And so I don't know who's keeping track of that or, or not keeping track of it, but it's something somebody's going to have to pay attention to. Yeah, well, on the regulatory side, it's kept track of by sampling the manure, but there are efforts to try and reduce it. You can share that. There are some initiatives called Whole Farm Nutrient Balance, which is looking at grain imports versus crop uptake versus phosphorus from your manure, basically, to look at the overall balance that's coming in and going off of farms. It's a pretty new initiative, but it's led by UBM Extension. Yeah. Yeah, so Heather's been studying feed and diets and trying to work with people to really assess it for a couple of years. And it's a space that it's, it's difficult. There's not really that many financial resources. We try and provide financial resources, but and it's really time intensive to be able to work with the farmer to gather that information and do it. But she's, she's been doing it. And I don't know. Hey, Diane, our, <laughs> you and E.V., we, we kept you on all morning and haven't gotten to you. Is there? We're, and we're running out of time. Is there another day that you t We have the secretary coming tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, at what 9 to 10 30. Is there, could you guys come back tomorrow morning at, with the secretary? Or? Um, sure, we, uh, Senator, we'd be glad to work with Linda to see if we can fit that in. I, I can't talk, speak to EB's schedule, but we'll figure it out. And that uh, you all are also, Laura Ginsburg was coming in, so it'd be all dairy. Oh. Three, three oh, folks on yeah, dairy that, and, you know. Yeah. Well, we, I mean, sorry, but we, we're running out of time. We should have started earlier, I guess. But anyways. Sure, uh, 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll have Linda get in contact with you. Uh, sure. Th thank you very much. Uh, so, Laura, uh, what, uh, what, as somebody that analyzed the, you know, we keep hearing, well, there's a lot of this phosphorus is coming in through the, the feed uh, that farmers are, commercial feed that they're buying. What, what does phosphorus, what part of the feed does the phosphorus uh, produce or, you know, or you, you well, it's a fundamental building block of everything, right? We all have phosphorus in it and it's necessary to grow. So it's within the feed. I So it's just part of the wheat or part of the oats or mm -hmm. part so, of the corn. Go ahead. 
Is it, did you have something on that, Diane? Yeah, you're going back into my old degree in animal science. You know, it was ruminant nutrition, so I know I know this stuff. Um, but yeah, it's in all the feed because it plants take it up. So it's going to be in the grain, but what they've really been looking at is a nutrient package. So they might vitamins and minerals for the cows. Yeah. And so in the past, it was thought you needed a lot of phosphorus in that vitamin and mineral pack to make sure the cow's reproductive system worked well. But now they're figuring out they can, you know, shrink that back to almost zero because it's in the plants. And so that was that's been the, a lot of the focus of research is how do you reduce this mineral pack, you know, the vitamin and mineral pack to the animals so they it doesn't really need phosphorus in it. And it took a lot of convincing, you know, when you change make a change like that, you got to convince everybody that it's not going to have any impact on the cows. So it's been over time and they're really moving toward that of reducing that phosphorus. But, you know, if grain comes from somewhere else and they don't have the same environmental requirements that we do, then they're not really working to reduce their phosphorus in the grain that they grow. So, you know, that's, that's a hard one to get that level to come down when we can't control what happens on farms, you know, outside of Vermont. But it has been that vitamin and mineral package been the, the thing they've been focusing on in the past to reduce that phosphorus. Well, well, I'm, I think you folks have got a pretty well-rounded team over there to, to manage and look after the best interests of our Vermont agriculture. And, and, you know, that that seems to be, you know, it is, it's really important. And, and uh, you have some younger folks coming along that um, are, of course, interested or they wouldn't be there in the first place. And, and uh, it's good uh, to uh, see that you've got a pretty darn good handle on things it's just too bad that more people couldn't sit through a meeting like this morning mm -hmm. and uh, publicize it more because a lot of times we get bad raps so we aren't doing it right not doing enough and it should have been done you know 10 years ago and, but anyways it, it was really a great morning and uh, certainly Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah no, I appreciate it. Sure. It's, it's great to finally have resources because I got beat up doing this job saying everything we're doing is wrong when I had very few resources to do the job. So it yeah. is, you can see what can happen when you put resources to it. Well, so. yeah. it uh, well hopefully uh, we'll get enough money to continue working. So thank, thank you, and yeah. thank you exactly. all for coming. Uh, and pass that on to the others, Diane. We really appreciate their time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank so you we'll much. try to catch up with you and EB tomorrow with, with the big guns. Will do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. thank well, thank, thank you. you for being with us, uh, both of you. So we'll uh, adjourn the meeting and uh,